36. Shiloh Easton, Day 5. The ATV bounced through a narrow break in the trees and burst onto the old logging road. Shiloh jerked the handlebars, turned hard, and headed east toward the town of Christmas. Her headlights caught the rutted road ahead of her. Great spruce, pine, birch, and hemlocks towered on either side, forming a gnarled black tunnel into the red-washed dark. Behind her, a second pair of headlights bounced onto the road. Shiloh glanced in her rearview mirror, her pulse a roar in her ears. Harsh lights bore down on her, catching her in the spotlight. The dark shape of a truck loomed behind the glare, ominous and indistinct. She'd driven every logging road within twenty miles of Christmas, and knew the twists and turns like the back of her hand. Problem was, this guy might too. Her mind raced. She visualized what lay ahead. The weed-choked gravel road curved in an undulating S, skirting Christmas, before snaking toward Munising. The logging road stretched on for a good ten miles before it hit another road. Few vehicles traversed the roads this time of night. He would overtake her long before then. Shiloh rounded a bend, braking slightly and leaning into the turn, then pushed the throttle and sped up to forty, forty-five, then fifty. Far slower than the powerful truck chasing her. She felt small and helpless, overpowered and outmanned. He would catch her. He could run her over. The ATV rounded another curve. She crouched, rising up from the seat to lean and keep from tipping. The truck's headlights kept her pinned, swallowed her up, caught her like a fly in a web. To her left, the dense forest bristled. Thick tree trunks grew close together, standing tall and silent and unbending. No passage to slip through no pathway to outmaneuver the monster at her back. To her right, the ground fell away, descending into a steep ravine littered with rocks and scraggly underbrush. He had her. The truck gunned its engine, loud and aggressive, taunting. It roared behind her, thirty feet, then twenty. Adrenaline shot through her veins. She held on tight, her arms rigid, muscles taut and straining. Sweat beaded her forehead, gathered beneath her armpits. Tendrils of her hair stuck slick to her skin. If she lost control for a second, the ATV could skid out from beneath her, pitch her over the ravine, or send her careening into a wall of trees at fifty miles an hour. The truck jammed in close. The driver honked the horn. She flinched, clenched the handlebars tight, and gritted her teeth. There had to be a way out of this had to be. She just had to find it. The truck dropped back. Thirty feet, then fifty, then a hundred. The headlights receded. Was he gonna let her go? No, he wouldn't. If he knew what she'd seen, if he even suspected. Shiloh held his freedom in her hands. They both knew it. Girl and driver, predator and prey. No way to walk away from this. He could not let her go, just like she could not ignore what she'd found. She'd go to Jackson, if she lived long enough. The four tracks took another bend, this time too fast. She skidded up on two wheels, overcorrected, and slid across the road. Gravel spit beneath her tires, her heart thumped, a block of ice in her belly. Behind her, the truck reappeared. The vehicle came barreling around the curve, tires growling over gravel, headlights stark and glaring. It came up fast, so fast. The headlights grew impossibly large in her rearview mirrors. The glare was blinding. She couldn't see, couldn't think. Then the truck shifted left and pulled up alongside her. It was painted a dark color, maybe blue, big shiny grill, large thick tires. The driver was a shadowy smudge at the edge of her vision. She dared not take her gaze from the road for even a second. She tried slowing. He slowed with her. She sped up. He shoved in tighter. His huge wheels spat gravel mere inches from the four-wheeler. 
Her exhausted muscles strained, clammy fingers cramped on the handlebars. How long could she last? The road was endless, her fear bottomless. Past the cone of the headlights, the logging road fell into red-tinged darkness. Twenty yards ahead, a sharp curve to the right appeared. Shiloh turned too fast, barely maintaining control. He turned with her. Tires squealed. He swerved in and clipped her rear. The four tracks lurched and fishtailed. It plowed sharply right toward the ravine, no control. She was utterly helpless, a scream locked behind her teeth. The ATV plowed across the weedy shoulder, teetered on a narrow ridge of earth. For a second, the four-wheeler hung suspended on a filament of air. Then she pitched over the edge. The world spun. The four tracks flipped end over end. Trees cartwheeled, ground and sky tumbled like a washing machine on spin cycle. Her fingers were ripped from the handlebars. Separated from the ATV, her body was loose and flailing. She was flying, spinning into darkness, toward a bottom she could not see. Her body bounced down the ragged slope like a rag doll. Her shoulder struck a rock. Her right shin hit something. Tree trunk, branch, boulder. Her heart slammed, terror in her throat, falling, sliding, scrambling for purchase and finding none. Dead leaves crumbled beneath her fingernails. Damp leaves slid beneath her. Bushes scratched her arms, her face, yanked hair from her scalp. Twigs jabbed her palms. Whether by miracle or instinct, she managed to throw her weight sideways. Her right shoulder glanced off a thick poplar trunk and spun her onto her back. She slid a few yards. Her spine hit something relatively soft, a thicket of bushes. Finally, she rolled to a halt. Half twisted on her side, legs bunched up. Pain radiated from her ribs, her right shoulder, her left ankle throbbed. A thunderous din came from above her. The four-wheeler was coming down. The machine slammed against boulders and bent saplings as it crashed down the hillside. No time to move, to escape, to do anything but scream. Shiloh shrank into a fetal position, threw her hands in front of her face, and braced for impact. With a screech of wrenching metal, the ATV smashed into the trunk of the poplar tree, not five feet up the slope from where she huddled. The great tree shuddered. Leaves rained down on her head and torso. The four tracks sputtered. Smoke billowed from the twisted wreck. The engine ticked in the abrupt stillness. The headlights flickered and then died. Shiloh heaved in great rasping breaths. Her lungs burned. Her pulse roared. Everything hurt. The world was still spinning. She was alive. But the threat was not over. 37. Shiloh Easton. Day 5. Shiloh's head swam. Her pulse thudded in her throat. She pressed one hand to her chest to make sure her jackrabbit heart hadn't thumped its way out of her chest. She strained her ears. In the aftermath of violence, the forest had gone quiet. No night sounds. No owls hooted or coyotes howled. No creatures scrabbled through the underbrush. Even the wind had died. The headlights blared from the ridgeline, probing the woods like spotlights. The white glow filtered through the leaves. Shadow and light made strange shapes in the night. The crimson aurora undulated through the black sky, like a blood stain you tried to scrub clean, but couldn't erase. She lay on her back, staring up at the headlights. She dared them to move, begged them to move. They didn't. The truck had stopped 50 feet above her. Maybe he'd exited the truck and was peering down into the void, deciding whether to go after her, weighing the odds. Shiloh didn't dare breathe. If she moved, he'd hear her. He'd smell her terror like a wolf and sniff her out. Her breath came in shallow, panicked gasps. 
The air smelled of dirt and sap. Vienna, Austria, Minsk, Belarus, Brussels, Belgium. She had to calm down, to think. Up on the ridge, a sound reached her, a muffled curse. The crunch of leaves and twigs underfoot as a large figure stomped through underbrush. A narrow beam swept across the trees, playing across her hiding spot. He had a flashlight. He was coming for her. He made so much noise that she had the opportunity to move. Gingerly, she sat up, feeling for broken bones. Everything hurt, but she could move her legs, her arms. Using the poplar trunk, she pulled herself to her feet. Pain shot up her ankle. She'd twisted it. No way could she run now. In a race, she could beat any boy her age. She was fiercer, faster, stronger. But with her injured ankle, this man would win. She longed for her crossbow. Stupidly, she'd left it back at the cave, choosing speed over weaponry. She still had her knife, her fingernails, her teeth, and her cunning. Frantically, she scanned her surroundings. It was hard to see anything in the murky shadows. If she used her pen light, she'd give herself away. Steep walls of rock and earth rose on either side of her. Everywhere she looked were more woods, more trees. Snarled branches and dense underbrush blocked her way. There were few places to hide. The forest that she loved took on a sense of malice. Hints of eyes, yellow in the red-tinged darkness, peered out of the gloom. Gnarled roots writhed underfoot, threatening to trip her, to trap her, to drag her under the damp earth and swallow her up. A grunt echoed from above her, curses and insults from a muffled masculine voice. Twigs crackled underfoot. The flashlight beam swept back and forth. He was higher up the ravine, searching the wrong places, but not for long. Any moment, the flashlight beam might pin her, revealing her location. Her gaze settled on the poplar tree and the smoking wreck at its base. Branches forked from the large trunk at regular intervals, starting at chest level. The lowest branches were as thick as her waist. Her pursuer would expect her to run. Any sane person would run. If she couldn't find a hole to squirrel into, she would climb up, out of sight, out of reach. If he had a gun, she was screwed. Otherwise, it was her only chance. Shiloh jerked her pen light out of her pocket, switched it on, and threw it deeper into the ravine. Then she climbed. Gritting her teeth against the pain, she reached for the branch above her, pulling herself upward with the strength of her arms and her good leg, then levered herself to the next branch. Her ankle throbbed. In the semi-darkness, she worked by touch, checking the branch first to ensure it would hold her weight. Shadows chased her up the trunk, ten feet, twenty, then thirty. She was a strong climber. Long summers spent outdoors made her agile and swift. As she climbed, she worked her way around the tree so that the trunk blocked her from the road. Below her, the sweeping flashlight beam settled on the wrecked four-wheeler. Shiloh froze. She clung to the branches, her stomach pressed to the trunk, the bark rough against her cheek. An ant crawled up her arm. One foot was stabilized. Her injured ankle hung unsupported, but she didn't dare move. Thirty feet below her, a man approached the wreckage. He slid down the embankment, cursing. As he thrashed through thorny underbrush, the beam of the flashlight never wavered from the crash site. Her breath lodged in her throat. She waited for him to look up, waited for those predator eyes to zero in on her. Would they glow in the dark like a bobcat's or a wolf's? Or maybe he was the evil Windigo spirit, made flesh. Did he have a gun? What would he do if he found her? Her mind began to disconnect unconsciousness threatening to draw her away, that blankness coming for her. She felt it happening and fought to stay present. Prague, Czechia, Copenhagen, Denmark. 
Shiloh bit down on her tongue until she drew blood. The taste of copper filled the back of her throat. She swallowed and pressed her cheek harder against the bark, holding her breath. She forced herself to look down. He stood beneath the poplar tree, breathing hard. She couldn't make out details. He was too far below her, too many branches and leaves obscuring her view. He was merely a dark shape behind the beam of the flashlight, a menacing, unknown presence. Where are you? He said aloud. Come out, come out, wherever you are. One fact did not elude her, however. She could tell by the shape of him how he walked, the tenor of his voice. The man who hunted her was not the school janitor. He was not Calvin Finch. The man studied the wreckage, head down. Then he squatted, pulled out his phone, and snapped a picture of the bumper stickers she'd plastered on the back. I heart Paris, the Statue of Liberty, Machu Picchu. He took a photo of the registration. The man stood, turned in a slow half circle, and swept the flashlight across the ground. His shadow was black as ink on the ground. Don't look up. Don't look up. He caught sight of the pen light's glow and moved away from the tree, headed further into the ravine. He paused, then walked several yards west, stopped again in front of a mulberry bush and picked up the pen light, then stood there for a long, silent minute, as if bewildered. Or thinking it out, considering the options, where a small girl might disappear to. Panic seized her. He was going to figure it out. Any minute, he was going to... Above them, a second set of headlights appeared on the logging road. The man went rigid. He flicked off the flashlight. The headlights drew closer. The noise of a car engine invaded the unnatural stillness. Shiloh clung to the tree, willing it to come closer, for the driver to see the man's truck, to stop. Folks were courteous in the Upper Peninsula. They watched out for their neighbors. The headlights slowed and came to a halt behind the truck. Doors slammed as two figures exited the vehicle. Low murmurs of concern drifted across the ravine. Hello? A female voice called. Anybody need help down there? I see shattered glass on the road, a male voice said. Looks like an accident. The man cursed. The nearness of it startled her, set her heart thumping. She could barely make out the shape of him as he turned back and started up the steep side of the ravine, climbing up to the road. Shiloh waited her body taut as piano wire. Her fingers felt like claws, her muscles cramped. The ant crawled across her cheek. A larger bug worked its way into her pant leg and wandered up her left shin. The man called out to the couple in a friendly voice. Disarming, non-threatening. There was an exchange of mingled voices, their words too indistinct to discern. More doors slammed. A pair of headlights flickered from high beam to low beam. Then the truck's engine growled as it pulled off the shoulder and back onto the road. It drove north. A moment later, the second vehicle followed behind it. Gradually, the noises faded to silence. Minutes passed, maybe hours. An owl hooted from somewhere. Only when she'd stopped shaking did she dare to move, to make the laborious descent limb by limb branch by branch. When she reached the bottom, her ankle gave out, and she crumpled to the leaf-littered ground. She curled into a ball, her knees tight to her chest, arms wrapped around her legs. Leaves stuck to her clothes, pine needles snarled in her hair. Shiloh was a thirteen-year-old girl in the woods at night. Not brave, not fierce, but scared and hurt and terribly utterly alone. 38. Eli Pope, Day 6. A soft crackle. Eli's eyes opened. He'd been dozing, dreaming of blood and war, of prison and broken bodies. He never slept soundly. Half his senses constantly alert to danger, to the slightest sound or sensation. 
the sound came again. It was 3 a.m. Something was wrong. Instantly, his hand moved for his weapons. His VP-9 and AK-47 lay beside him within easy reach. AK-47 in hand, he rose to his knees and peered from the firing port he'd built into the lean-to. At his 12 o'clock, 30 feet ahead, the tent sat in the middle of the clearing. The aurora bathed the site in a soft red glow. He'd placed a chem light in the tent and used heated rocks from the campfire in the general shape of a man, head, body, legs. Luckily, the tent was floorless. If enemies tried to sneak up on him, even on IR, it would appear like Eli was sleeping, oblivious, inside the tent. Even if they didn't have infrared, they'd see a light source inside the tent, giving Eli the precious seconds he'd need to engage or flee. He strained his ears. The burble of the river, the buzz of night insects, the rustle of the trees. A twig bent and snapped, the swish of footsteps through leaves. The sounds came from the southwest, maybe thirty, forty yards, outside the perimeter warning he'd set, but headed his direction. Something, or someone, was out there. Over his clothes, he slipped on the ghillie suit jacket he'd made to blur his shape against the forest. Within two seconds, he'd exited via the rear of the lean-to, pistol holstered and rifle in hand. A cold, calm alertness descended. His breathing slowed, his heart rate steadied. Half crouched, he circled behind his shelter to the left, shifting from the cover of the boulder to the cover of an enormous white pine, the trunk as thick as a tire. His barefoot footsteps were quiet. He moved as one with the shadows, silent and invisible and lethal. A rattle of rocks against tin. His perimeter alarm system had been tripped. The alarm consisted of a length of fishing wire attached to metal cans filled with pebbles. It was simple, yet incredibly effective. Eli took a knee, braced himself, and raised the AK-47 to his shoulder. His finger rested on the trigger guard. He peered through his ACOG scope and waited for his prey. Whoever hunted him would receive a rude awakening. The moon hid behind a raft of clouds. It didn't matter. The aurora was bright, red flames undulating overhead outlining familiar shapes in crimson, the trees, the Dakota fire pit, the fallen log he used for seating, the makeshift clothesline, the tent, the boulder hunched behind it, the lean-to. The river gurgled over rocks and logs. Small creatures slunk through the underbrush. His mind emptied of all thought but the task at hand, eliminate the threat, shoot to kill. Another sound, a cry like a wounded animal. The hairs on the back of his neck rose. Twenty yards to the east, juniper leaves trembled, agitated by whatever creature, animal or human, disturbed it. Through a thicket of elderberry bushes, past the cluster of jack pines, beneath the canopy of a maple. Silent, Eli rose to his feet. Remaining crouched, light on his feet, he placed each step with care, heel to toe. Every movement slow and deliberate, he began to circle the outskirts of the clearing, shifting from tree to tree, from cover to cover, as he closed in on his target. Muscles tensed, weapon up, ready to fire. Five minutes later, he rounded a cluster of boulders and his target appeared. Eli stared down at it for several heartbeats. Not an it. Her. Shiloh Easton curled in a fetal position on the ground. Her right leg had tangled in his tripwire. Her crossbow lay a few feet away like she'd dropped it as she fell. This girl had dragged herself from somewhere. Her camp at the cave was about three miles via the ATV trails, or somewhere even further. Limping, bleeding, in pain. He couldn't imagine how difficult it had been. At least she'd been able to take the trail. In her right hand, she clutched her small knife like she was ready to fight demons and monsters, even to the point of collapse. A groan escaped her lips. In the half-darkness, he could see she was hurt. Alert for danger, 
He scanned the woods and listened hard. He studied the ground, the trees, the rocks, and rise of the hill leading to the bluffs beyond them. There were no shadows that did not belong. Satisfied that they were alone, he slung the rifle over his shoulder and crouched beside her. He wasn't a medic, but he knew first aid and kept an IFAC, individual first aid kit, in his rucksack. He felt her pulse. It was strong and steady, though fast. He checked her breathing, then skimmed her body with his hands, searching for wounds, for broken bones, for blood. She whimpered when he touched her shoulder and again when he felt her right ankle. It was already swollen, twisted, possibly sprained. Pausing, he again listened to the forest sounds. Nothing out of place, no signs of danger. Untangling her foot from his tripwire, he reset it, feeling the lumpy ground for the stones and replacing them inside the can. Don't leave me, Shiloh said. Did anyone follow you? She shook her head. This is going to hurt. I'm not scared. He grunted, bent, and gathered her into his arms. For so fierce a soul, she was light as a feather. How young she was, young and vulnerable and alone. He cradled her as a shepherd cradled a lamb and hurried back to his campsite. My crossbow. I'll get it. Don't talk. That makes it hurt more. She turned her head and buried her face into his chest. A mewling sound escaped her lips like a wounded kitten. Fury flared through him, hot and sharp, at whoever would harm this child. Eli knelt and half crawled into his shelter then lowered her atop his bivy sack. Shucking the rifle but keeping it close by, he reached for his rucksack and withdrew his flashlight and IFAC. I need to check you for injuries, he said gruffly. That okay? Shiloh stared up at him with eyes wide and unblinking, black as beetle shells. She did not flinch or cry out. Her teeth gritted against the pain. Bruises bloomed across her left shoulder and upper chest, Cuts and scrapes marred her bare arms. A nasty bruise was turning a deep bluish black on her left shin. He checked her visually. Her skin tone was pink. Her breathing and chest movements appeared normal. She was alert and could speak in complete sentences. She could move her arms and legs, though her right ankle was swollen and tender to the touch. Luckily, her ribs had escaped the brunt of it. Without an X-ray machine, he had no way to know whether they were cracked or broken. He'd treat them the same either way, as long as there was no flailed chest injury where three or more adjacent ribs were fractured in two or more places, a grave wound. Using a battery-operated lantern for light, he rinsed the cuts with sterile water from his water bottle and dressed them with antibiotic ointment, then used liquid Band-Aid to seal the lacerations. He reinforced her ankle with a splint he kept in his rucksack. His fingers were too rough, awkward and fumbling. He didn't remember how to be gentle, how to treat fragile things with such care. His hands were built for violence. He wasn't any good at this. He growled in frustration. I should take you to a hospital. No, she said. You should see a doctor. They'll get the police. That's a good thing. No. You need. No. A hospital. She raised her knife and pointed it at his chest. He stilled, kneeling beside her. In one hand, he held gauze. In the other, ointment. Put it away. Promise. No hospital. Put the knife down, damn it. She sucked in a pained breath. The point of the knife settled at his breastbone. He crouched over her, unmoving. He knew ten ways to disarm her, but he didn't want to do it like that. She didn't take her eyes from his. They burned fierce and undimmed. The police will get social services. They'll take me away. I'll never come home. I'll never find Cody. They think he did it. I know he didn't. No police, no hospital. He shook his head. This was a bad idea, a terrible idea. 
Maybe Jackson was right. He was going about this all wrong. The professionals should handle this. Handle her. This was a mistake. And yet, at the same time, she was not wrong. He knew what it was like to be the one sucked into the massive, indifferent machine of the justice system. How swiftly the jaws of the law could consume you. It didn't matter if you were innocent. He couldn't bring himself to betray her. She had come here, hurt and scared. She'd come to him when she had no one else. Didn't matter how many times he told himself he didn't care, that she was none of his business. No hospital, he said. No police. The knife lowered. She let out a relieved sound that was half sigh, half groan. He took the blade from her limp fingers and set it beside his rifle. What happened? The four-wheeler went off the road, into a ravine. Shiloh must have been thrown free of it, or her injuries would have been much worse. An accident? She stared up at him, shook her head. Someone did this to you. She didn't have to answer. Her burning eyes revealed the truth. Who? I don't know yet. You didn't see him? Too dark. Any details? Any information you can give me? She shook her head in mute fear. He leaned back on his heels and appraised her. She was battered, but not broken, not on the outside. The most dangerous scars were on the inside, where they did their damage unseen. She gave him a beseeching look. Hungry. Despite himself, a smile tugged at his lips. He dug around in his rucksack and retrieved two Snickers bars. I'm out of the protein ones. Even better. He peeled back the wrapper and handed one to her, taking the other for himself. He propped her head up with a pillow so she could eat without choking. How's your jaw? Okay? She chewed cautiously, then nodded. They sat in silence while they ate. She pointed for his water bottle and he handed it to her. She finished the candy bar in a few bites, and then drank half the bottle without coming up for air. The girl's eyelids slid closed. Exhaustion slackened her features. She'd held on as long as she could. Now she was here with him, safe, where she could let go. He put away the eye fac and stuffed the bloodied gauze into a plastic trash bag. He checked outside and walked the perimeter. He retrieved the crossbow then checked the decoy tent. He examined the hushed landscape for several minutes before slipping inside the shelter. He checked on Shiloh again. Sleep, girl. Don't leave, she said without opening her eyes. He said, I won't. As she drifted into sleep, an alien emotion plucked at his chest, so foreign he didn't recognize it. His hardened, scarred heart was numb deadened, from war, from prison. Nothing left of him but rage, bitterness, and vengeance. As a convict, he'd been reduced to an animal. He'd lost everything but that instinct to kill. Maybe, just maybe, he hadn't. Eli would not sleep more tonight. He'd sit and keep watch all night. This night, and the next, and the next for as long as she needed. He looked down at her and whispered, whoever did this, whoever made you so afraid, I'll find him and I'll end him. 39, Eli Pope, day six. Eli felt eyes boring into him the second he opened the door to the IGA country store in the town of Christmas. The bell above the door jangled in welcome. He wasn't welcome here. He knew that. But he needed a few supplies, for himself and for Shiloh, who was sleeping soundly in his lean-to shelter. And so, here he was. He'd biked back to his father's house and drove the silver 1998 Pontiac Bonneville into town. Surprisingly, it still had gas in the tank and ran fine. He moved down the narrow aisles. The lights weren't working. Watery daylight streamed through the dusty windows. 
The generator hummed as it provided power to the refrigerated section in the back. He'd planned to get something halfway healthy for Shiloh to eat, but the shelves were barren. Most items were out completely. Two of the freezers were empty. The refrigerator carried the few beers that remained. He recognized the woman behind the counter, Michelle Carpenter. Her father had run the place when Eli was a kid. Later, she had taken over the store after her parents died, while Eli was overseas fighting classified wars that the average American knew nothing about. Every time he'd returned home on leave, he'd visit the store for his favorite beer, Molson Canadian. Mrs. Carpenter had kept it stocked for him, traveling across the border once a month to source it. Now the woman watched his every move, her back straight, one hand on the counter, the other clutching her cell phone. Her face formed a rictus of revulsion and hatred. His skin grew hot, his hands clammy. He felt himself shrink inward, growing smaller, and despised himself for it. He should be used to this by now, his black heart inured to rejection. Why had he thought this was a good idea? Eli stood still in the center of the beer aisle, frozen in place. He didn't know why he'd bothered to check. She didn't stock it anymore. Why would she? And even if she did, it was already gone. The Molson Canadian beer he'd loved had convicted him in the end. A fingerprint on a bottle. A spot of blood. The tainted bottle left in his car for the cops to find. The doorbell jangled and two people entered, Tim Brooks and Gideon Crawford. They were former friends, and they'd been part of the mob that had accosted him on his doorstep. Eli tensed. His VP-9 was holstered at the small of his back beneath his black T-shirt, around chambered. The AK-47 he'd stowed in the back seat of the Bonneville beneath a blanket. He had no intention of using either weapon, but he wouldn't back down if it came to it. The men were arguing about the best fishing spots in Alger County and didn't notice him at first. Instinctively, he checked them visually for weapons. They appeared unarmed. He thought of the night they'd spent drinking eight years ago. How one of them might have taken a used beer bottle from the bar and framed him. But no, Sawyer had told him who had betrayed him. He still didn't want to believe it. Gideon caught sight of him, elbowed Tim, and they headed straight for him. On wooden legs, he exited the beer aisle and took his meager supplies to the counter. Bleach to purify water, a handful of Snickers bars to bring back for Shiloh, a bottle of soy sauce. The soy sauce wasn't a necessity. He just wanted some damn flavor with his dinner. He felt the presence of the two men behind him. They'd gone dead quiet. Eli dug in his pockets and set two wrinkled twenties on the counter. Your money is no good here, Michelle said. I have the right to shop. His voice was too quiet. The resolute indifference that had served him in prison had deserted him. He knew this woman, this place, these people. I don't serve killers. He couldn't meet her eyes. Humiliation permeated his insides, his tongue thick in his mouth. A sickening sense of claustrophobia overwhelmed him. The empty shelves crowded in, the shadows heavy and thick. In that moment, it didn't matter that he wasn't guilty. Suffocating shame threatened to choke him. I called the police, Mrs. Carpenter lied. He knew she hadn't. There was no service, but he didn't correct her. Her body shook with anger, accusation in her eyes. I used to babysit Lily. I have a daughter. If you lay a hand on her, I will fillet you and hang your entrails around your neck and drown you in the lake. And that would not be the death that you deserve. You need help, Michelle? Tim Brooks asked. Looks like we need to take out the trash, Gideon snarled. They sounded like bad TV actors. It didn't matter. Eli felt like he'd been sucker punched in the gut. 
mortified. He wanted nothing more than to escape to his campsite in peace. Keep the change. He scooped up his items, leaving the cash, and backed away. Mrs. Carpenter said nothing. Her red-rimmed eyes glistened like she was on the verge of weeping. Her hands pressed flat on the counter, palms down, fingers splayed as if they were holding her up. Like her willpower was the only thing keeping her upright. Eli spun on his heels. The men stood behind him, blocking his way. A surge of anger broke through his chagrin. He made a lunging motion at them. Move, or you'll regret it. The men scrambled backward. Fear and loathing warred across their features. Fear and self-preservation won out. Gideon's shoulder struck the rack of touristy magnets and several clattered to the tile floor. Tim bumped into a shelf holding the last bags of Doritos. Eli marched between them, unmolested. Don't come back, Gideon spat at his back. The bell over the door jangled before Eli reached it. Jackson Cross strode in, dressed in his deputy's uniform. His sandy hair must. A five o'clock shadow rimmed his jaw, bruises beneath his eyes like he hadn't slept in days. Tired or not, those clear hazel eyes swept the store and took in the situation in an instant. He nodded his head at Michelle. Mrs. Carpenter, he turned to the men. Keep shopping. Have a good day. Jackson opened the door wide and motioned for Eli to follow him out. Eli obeyed without argument. Once they were a good ten yards past the front door, Jackson wheeled on him, his expression livid. What the living hell, Eli? A man has to shop. Then drive to the Sioux, or Marquette, or anywhere but here. Can't you see these people can't handle it? You're liable to get yourself shot. He couldn't help himself. I think you have that the other way around. Jackson threw up his hands. I'm trying to keep the peace here. I'm doing my best to keep a volatile situation from exploding. Sounds like you're doing a bang-up job of it. What the hell does that mean? They stood a few feet apart. Lines bracketed his old friend's mouth, framed his tired eyes. He looked like he'd aged a decade since the last time Eli had seen him. You find Easton's killer yet? Maybe I'm looking at him. The sick feeling was fading fast, replaced by a familiar anger that Eli wore like a favorite pair of jeans. The anger fed him, soothed him, drove him. Screw you, Cross. No, you do not get to do this. You do not get to turn this around like you're the injured party here. You cannot torment these townspeople. They've grieved for eight years. Let them live with their ghosts. Leave them alone. Live out there like a survivalist hermit in the National Forest. I don't care. But do not interfere with my county. Do not cause trouble. I am warning you, Eli. Eli went still. He had never responded well to threats. His lip curled in derision. Or what? Jackson stood taller, his eyes flashing. I'm not the naive little kid who once followed you around like a puppy, worshipping your every move. You can't manipulate me. You can't lie to me. That kid that believed in you? That person is dead. Dead and gone. He died with Lily. I don't doubt it, Eli said, quieter. A dark current hummed through him, but he held it in check. He remembered Sawyer's accusation, the insinuation, and he wondered. What do you think you can do to me, Jackson? He paused a beat. Or maybe the real question is, what have you already done? 40. Eli Pope. Day 6. A rusted pickup rumbled past the IGA's parking lot. The passenger's side window rolled down. He recognized Dana Lutz. She spat out the window and gave him the finger. Eli gave her the finger in return. He tensed, 
anticipating another altercation. But the truck kept going. You have no idea, Eli, Jackson said. No clue. You're out there in the boonies rubbing two sticks together while things are falling apart here in the real world. Eli made an exaggerated show of looking around. I don't see anything falling apart. Just because it's happening slowly doesn't mean it isn't happening. The frog sits in boiling water, doesn't he? He doesn't realize it until he's cooked through. People are going to need a lot of help real soon. I'm trying to figure out how to give it, how to prepare for what's coming. What's coming, Jackson? Jackson gave a helpless shrug. You know the power is out across the country, right? The entire northern hemisphere has gone dark. Banks are closed. The internet is down. Planes are grounded. Michelle's usual delivery is three days late, with no restock in sight. They're reporting rioting in some of the big cities. People are already running out of food. I'm good. I can live without civilization just fine. Jackson snorted. No one's worried about you. Civilization wants to live without you. It's the rest of them I'm worried about. Eli looked at him steadily. When you cared so little about your own life, it was difficult to muster up sympathy for nearly eight billion faceless souls. He didn't like the people he knew, let alone the masses he didn't. People will adapt, or they won't. Jackson threw up his hands. You only see things from your own distorted perspective. That's nothing new. I'm wasting my time. I have work to do. Anger flared through Eli. He tamped it down. You're doing such a great job with Shiloh. Jackson's gaze sharpened. How do you know anything about Shiloh? Eli didn't answer. He turned on his heel and started for the Bonneville. He still held the bleach and candy bars. He'd stuck the soy sauce in his front pocket. Jackson followed him. Wait. Eli stopped short. A word had been spray-painted in dripping red across the rear window of the car. Killer. How long had he been in the store? Ten minutes? Fifteen? Who had seen him drive in? The two idiots in the store were gone. They had peeled out a minute ago. His father had driven the big silver Bonneville for twenty years. Everyone knew whose it was. They would know who drove it now. Jackson saw it, but gave no indication that he cared. Fine. Eli would ignore it, too. What was one more humiliation? One more act of hatred to throw on the pile. Why did you say her name? Eli, answer me. He moved to the passenger door and deposited the bleach, candy bars, and soy sauce in the front seat. He paused, considering. There was no way he would give up her location to Jackson. At the same time, Jackson could do his damn job if he had more information. She was there. She saw it happen, Easton's murder. How do you know that? Jackson demanded. Eli turned back around to face him. Maybe you should do a better job protecting your witnesses. You've seen her? You've talked to her? What the hell? Stay away from her, Eli, so help me if you hurt her. I resent the insinuation against my character. Jackson sputtered, a muscle jumping in his jaw. Tendons stood out like cords against his neck. It took him a moment to regain the control to speak again. Where is she? Eli stared at him, impassive. She's a little girl, alone in the woods. She needs help. Maybe, Eli allowed. Tell me where she is, or bring her to the station. That's an order, Eli. I can arrest you. I can throw you in jail for any charge I wish. Don't tempt me. She doesn't want to come in. Until she does, I'm not telling you a damn thing. Jackson took two rapid steps and jabbed his finger in Eli's face. You don't get to do this. Instinct and rage took over. Eli seized Jackson's right hand, twisted it hard, and flipped it nearly backward, 
bending Jackson's arm at the elbow at an unnatural angle. Jackson's bones ground in protest beneath his grip. He could have broken the man's wrist. He stopped short. Hurt and surprise flashed across Jackson's face. He hadn't expected it. He should have. Jackson wasn't a weakling. He was strong and fit. He knew how to shoot, how to throw a punch when he had to. But he was a poet at heart, a philosopher. No elite soldier. He hadn't fought and bled and survived inside a cage filled with the worst kind of animals. Grunting in pain, Jackson shoved Eli in the chest with his free hand. He did not reach for his sidearm. Let me go. Eli glanced across the parking lot. Through the dusty windows, Michelle Carpenter stared at him. The blood drained from her face, repugnance in her eyes. Jackson shoved him again. So help me, Eli. Eli released Jackson's wrist. He stepped back. Th that's assault of an officer. Eli hadn't heard Jackson stutter in 15 years, maybe more. It came out in moments of great distress. Jackson was angry. He was also afraid, but not of Eli. If you arrest me, I'll never tell you where Shiloh is, Eli said flatly. I will never help you. Like you would ever help anyone but yourself. You don't know me. Jackson rubbed his wrist, breathing hard. He looked at Eli. No, I don't. I never did, did I? Is that what you tell yourself so that you can sleep at night? Jackson blinked. Memories flashed through Eli's mind. The blur of the trial. The accusations. The expert testimony on strangulation, on fingerprints, and domestic violence. The faces in the courtroom. The hostility of those who had once known him, even loved him. Sawyer's damning words echoed in his ears. What did you do, Jackson? Eli asked. I don't know what you're talking about. I was framed. I told you that. Someone framed me. I didn't drink that Molson Canadian at Lily's house that night. I didn't leave it in my car. I did drink one three hours earlier at your house. I left it in your trash can. A shadow shifted behind Jackson's eyes a thing Eli recognized only because he knew it so intimately himself. Shame. Sawyer had been telling the truth. Jackson had done something. He'd colluded in tampering with the evidence. Had he planted the beer bottle himself? Whatever he had done, he must have believed wholeheartedly in Eli's guilt. He believed it still. Eli could see it written across his face. Eli felt stripped bare, his breath like glass in his throat, his skin flayed from his bones. Jackson Cross, his brother, his best friend. It hurt, even now, even after all this time. What did you do, Jackson? Eli whispered. For a second, the shame was there in Jackson's eyes. It swam black and oily beneath the surface. And then it vanished. Jackson's face closed, his expression hardened with resolve. With a grimace, he shook his head. Whatever secrets he carried, he would keep them close to his chest. Until Eli forced them out into the light. Until he enacted his own justice. I did my job. Jackson kept his eyes straight ahead. His skin had gone pale. He was pale all the way down to his soul. I put a murderer behind bars. Eli took a deep breath. The old pain burrowed inside him, a hollowness in his chest. Abandonment, betrayal, and the anger that had served him for eight years, for his entire life. A bitter smile carved his face. So help me, Jackson. If you were the one who did this to me, I will kill you. His words were a wound between them, a wound that would never heal. Eli left Jackson standing alone on the cracked, weedy asphalt, staring after him. He returned to the Bonneville, 
He opened the door, sat in the driver's seat, and inserted the key in the ignition. The engine started and he pulled out of the IGA parking lot. The word killer still painted across the rear window and seared into his soul. 41. Jackson Cross. Day 6. Jackson stood at the bow of the risky business as Sawyer expertly handled the yacht, motoring them through the bay out into the lake. The black and white skull flag rippled in the wind. Grand Island rose before them, a dim shape in the fog. Mist swirled at its base, drifting across the placid surface of Superior. Few boats were out. The boating season hadn't started yet. With the local businesses shuddering due to lack of electricity, most of the tourists had headed home, even the Aurora watchers. You, me, the boat, and open water, Sawyer said. It's the only way to talk. Sawyer's protection team had frisked Jackson before allowing him anywhere near Sawyer. No weapons, no wires. There were six mercenaries that he could see, several more that he couldn't. Sawyer's mercenaries were tough, stern men, well-armed and not averse to violence. They went over him again with an RF meter, then took his wallet, cell phone, keys, sunglasses, everything, anything that could have a recording device implanted or tracking device to put on the boat. Jackson knew Sawyer's rules. It was why he'd left Devon behind. You came alone, or you didn't come at all. It was a risk. It was dangerous. Jackson knew that. No law enforcement officer in his right mind would board a boat unarmed with a known criminal. Jackson needed answers. And if getting them quickly meant he didn't go through normal channels, then so be it. He also knew that Sawyer played by his own sort of rules. They'd known each other their whole lives. They had history. And that history would protect them both. It was a risk for Sawyer, too, to speak with Jackson without a high-priced attorney present. But Sawyer had always appreciated an element of risk. To what do I owe this pleasurable visit? It's been a while. Sawyer's dirty blonde hair was windblown. He wore pleated khaki shorts and a pale blue polo shirt. He looked the part of a scruffy sailor married to the sea. But they both knew he was much more than that. You're a hard man to pin down, Sawyer. Sawyer gave a nonchalant shrug. I'm busy. It so happened that today's fishing charter trip was canceled. The CEO of First Northern Bank quit his job and is bugging out to his cabin in the Porcupine Mountains. I'm investigating the Easton homicide. Sawyer turned his gaze on Jackson, his expression unreadable. Jackson had always found Sawyer's flat eyes disquieting. Even as kids, Sawyer had been different. He could turn his charm on and off like a light switch, become your best friend or your worst enemy at the drop of a hat. May I ask you some questions? You're free to ask, Jackson. Whether I answer is up to me. Of course. What is your connection to Easton? Business associates. How so? That's private. Where were you on May 17th, between the hours of 3 and 6 p.m.? Out here? On my boat. Can anyone confirm that? You're asking questions like, I'm a suspect here, Cross. His gray eyes narrowed. He'd never looked more shark-like or dangerous. Be very careful in what you say next. Jackson was extremely aware of his lack of a sidearm. He felt naked, exposed. His hands hung loose at his sides, ready to curl into fists. His wrist was still sore from his altercation with Eli. Jackson knew how to defend himself, and he would fight, if necessary. He didn't think it would come to that. You wouldn't try anything, Sawyer. You know better. So let's not pretend that you would. His smile faltered the tiniest fraction. Killing a law enforcement officer, that would be dirty, even for you. Not that you could accomplish it if you tried. 
Sawyer studied him for a long moment, his smile pasted like a sticker onto his face. He moved back a step and raised a hand, palm out, in a gesture of surrender. Touché, old friend. I am not your friend. So people keep telling me. I'm starting to feel rejected, Cross. It's not a feeling I appreciate. I don't care about your feelings. You hate me, don't you? Jackson started. It wasn't a statement he'd been expecting. That has nothing to do with it. Sure it does. Sawyer kept his gaze on the bluffs. You were always jealous of me with Lily. Jackson stiffened. He tamped down the surge of embarrassment, mixed with anger. He hated hearing Lily's name out of Sawyer's mouth. That it was also the truth was a bitter pill to swallow. Lily's eye had always wandered to the bad boys, Eli and Sawyer, and occasionally Gideon Crawford. She'd bobbed between them throughout their high school years, into college, and beyond. Lily had loved Eli, but Eli's affections were complicated. When he rejected her, she went to Sawyer or Gideon for comfort and distraction. Most people believed that Lily's children were Sawyer's, or at least that Cody was. But Sawyer hadn't claimed either of them, not when they were born, not after Lily's homicide, and not now. Jackson had despised him for it. It felt like a weakness, this resentment he'd harbored for years. As much as he despised himself for it, he couldn't help it. I'm here to talk about Easton's homicide, not the past. Sawyer grunted. It's always about the past. The past never dies. When you finally figure that out, maybe you'll become a decent cop. Under Sheriff. Sawyer only smiled. Jackson smiled back. He was used to criminals trying to get a rise out of him. Hell, his whole family did it for sport. We have the phone calls. We have the logs and the texts. They didn't have the texts, but Sawyer didn't need to know that. Before the system went down, we traced the money. You created several shell accounts, but it came from you. The money Easton used to pay off his property taxes. He was going to lose the land, all of it. Then boom, in one fell swoop, he's got the money to pay off three years of back taxes. It was you, and I want to know why. Sawyer gave a noncommittal grunt. You paid him for something, payback, revenge. There are a hundred reasons why criminals get into bed with each other. Maybe he didn't do what you'd paid him for. Maybe things went badly, or he was blackmailing you for something. Sawyer didn't blink. I thought you wanted Cody Easton for it. Frustrated, Jackson gritted his teeth. Somehow, Sawyer often knew things he shouldn't know. Jackson suspected Sawyer had a paid informant on the Munising Police Department payroll or in the sheriff's office, but he'd never been able to prove it. Cody is a person of interest, that's all. <laughs> and I'm the Queen of England. Jackson sighed. I'm keeping my options open. You're looking extremely good right now. You've got the motive, the means. How about opportunity? I'll ask you again. Where were you the afternoon of May 17th? On my boat. Like I said, fishing. By yourself, I presume. Sawyer laughed, a flat, empty sound that grated against Jackson's ears. Of course not. I was with Cyrus Lee and a few others. They'll swear by it. I'm sure they will. Jackson rolled his eyes. Sawyer's minions would do anything for him. We're going to be looking hard at you, Sawyer. Your business, your boats, your financials, your comings and goings. I imagine a man like you wouldn't appreciate such scrutiny. No, I suppose not. So it's in your best interest to clear your name. If you're clean, tell me, so that I can move on and hunt down the real killer. That's all I want, Sawyer. I don't care about whatever else you're up to. 
To the right rose the rocky cliffs of the pictured rock's coastline. The fog was lifting, the coastline hazy and indistinct, but still spectacular. His breath caught in his chest. Seagulls wheeled and soared above the cliffs, white specks against the iron-gray sky. Thousands of years of wind and water had molded the shoreline into a 15-mile expanse of dramatic cliffs. Dozens of waterfalls splashed down the cliffs, the water mingling with minerals in the sandstone to create giant abstract works of art. Shades of browns and reds from iron, black from manganese, greens and blues from copper. Like God himself had painted the rocks in brilliant color. All right, Jackson, Sawyer said finally. You want the truth? I'll throw you a bone, but only because I'm in a giving spirit. You want to talk? Let's talk. 42. Jackson Cross. Day 6. Sawyer watched the mist-shrouded cliffs. I assume you know the DEA has a hard-on for me. They've been trying to nail me for years, just like you have. Surveilling my reputable businesses. I'm not supposed to know. Sawyer winked at him. But I know. They're watching the docks 24-7 now. I appreciate my privacy, if you know what I mean. Jackson waited him out. He knew about the multi-jurisdictional task force that included the Michigan State Police and the DEA. They were under orders to stay out of it. But this was bigger than that. I had protection. Line certain pockets and they'll throw you a bone when you need it. When Samuel Anderson died in that pandemic surge last year, I was left with a hole in my resources. I'm nothing, if not resourceful, Jackson. I'm sure you know that by now. Jackson knew. This is all hypothetical, of course. Of course. Let's say our hypothetical businessman is moving considerable product. He's the main source for the entire UP and has gained traction downstate as well. Branching into new services, reaching new clients. Business is booming. But now he needs a secondary location for certain exchanges, away from prying eyes. He shrugged. What does it realtors always say? Location, location, location. Let's say that Easton's private dock afforded us the advantages that we needed. Two businessmen worked out a deal. That's it, Jackson. No more, no less. Then why would you kill him? Why, indeed. And that why is critically important, Jackson. Hypothetically, that certain individual is devastated that Easton is dead. Things were working out just fine before he got himself axed. Jackson let Sawyer's words sink in, considered them, turned them over like stones in his mind, looking for the cracks, the weaknesses, the defects. He found none. I had no reason to eliminate him, Cross. You're looking in all the wrong places. Jackson had the same unsettled feeling. And Cody Easton? What about him? Cody Easton was using a small aluminum fishing boat called the Little Neptune. It's registered in your name. I lent it to him. Why? Because he asked. He likes to go night fishing. A boy needs a pastime, a real one, not that drawing and poetry crap. He was going to buy it. I hired him to work it off. What did Cody do for you? Odds and ends. Can you be more specific? Am I talking to a cop or a concerned citizen? My answers depend on you. I want the truth. Sawyer looked across the water. Cody isn't a bad kid, too soft, moody. He needs to be toughened up. He wanted out of this town, so I told him he needed money to do that. 
Real money from a real job, not serving ice cream to drunk tourists three months a year for minimum wage. Jackson felt sick. It's true, then. You had him dealing at the middle school, you pig. Name-calling will get you nowhere, Sawyer said wryly. What the hell is wrong with you? It's business, Cross. That's all it is. Good business. Seeding the next generation. They're going to do it anyway. I might as well be the one who gets rich off it. You're disgusting. That kid will go to college now. He can paint toilets for art galleries or write poetry or whatever the hell he thinks he wants. But it's going to get him out. He won't be trapped here like... Sawyer's voice trailed off. He looked away, out across the bluffs, and shook his head. I'm giving him a future, which is more than you or anyone else can say. Anger filled him. Everything he did to keep this county together, to make it a safe place for kids to grow up. Men like Sawyer came behind him and knocked it all down. Crystal meth was an epidemic in the Upper Peninsula, as it was elsewhere. In wide rural swaths of the state, where treatment was scarce and the drug was anything but, meth had eclipsed the opioid epidemic. You're a monster, and you don't even see it, do you? Settle down, Jackson. You're always so uptight. I don't give the babies the hard stuff, okay? They get Adderall, Ritalin, and Vyvanse, the usual suspects. I have a soul. Jackson doubted it. You're destroying lives, not saving them. You say tomato, I say tomato. Did Cody use? Nah, my people don't use. They're not stupid. It didn't make him feel better. You have no conscience. Sawyer gave a dark laugh. Conscience. What's a conscience but religious and social structures designed to keep the individual small and docile and under their thumb? There's right and wrong. There's no such thing. There never was. Jackson shook his head. There was no use arguing with him. Sawyer was a different sort of monster, but not the kind that Jackson was searching for today. He'd have to verify Sawyer's alibi. Not that Sawyer's friends were reliable, but he did believe him. As long as everything he'd said checked out, Sawyer would have no reason to kill Easton. Much as Jackson hated it, that left Cody. Sawyer steered them closer to the rocks. Massive boulders slipped by beneath the surface of the water. It appeared that the yacht would strike them, but somehow they skimmed over the surface. The boulders were deeper than they appeared. This county is balanced on a precipice, Cross. I know. You aren't stupid. That's one thing you never were. Naive, yes. Blind, certainly. And pathetic. But not stupid. Is there supposed to be a compliment in there? Sawyer responded with a question. You know what's happening, don't you? Jackson turned his attention from the rocks and faced Sawyer. The afternoon sun had burned off the last of the fog. The surface of the water barely ruffled, smooth as glass. The whole world reflected upside down. You tell me what you think is happening. Sawyer grinned. The light hit his eyes for the first time, and he looked happy as a kid at Christmas. So glad you asked. You think the power is coming back? Jackson hesitated. There was no reason not to say it. No, I don't. Sawyer nodded, like he was confirming something to himself. So many people are still too slow to get it. They've had, what, a week now of these freak light shows? They've watched the news until they lost power and their TVs went dark. They can't use their phones, can't sign on to the internet, can't get cash from the banks, can't get gas from gas stations. They can't use their credit cards. 
And still, how many people think everything will go back to normal? At least half. Agreed. It's an opportunity. It's a disaster. Sawyer sighed. You have no imagination. Anyone ever tell you that? No. The sun burned bright overhead. Shaking his head, as if disappointed, Sawyer swung the yacht around and headed back to the harbor. There are finite resources, Jackson. Always have been, but now it's for real, for keeps. Someone is going to be king of the mountain, and it's not who you think. Whatever you're thinking, don't try it. You won't win. We'll see, won't we? Seagulls arced overhead, squawking to each other. Their cries echoed as the risky business sailed past a massive cavern hewn out of the rock face. A pile of huge car-sized boulders had buried a narrow band of shoreline. Remember that I helped you, Jackson. When the time comes. Remember that I didn't arrest you when the time comes. Sawyer grinned. Touché. A few summers ago, a 200-foot shelf of bluff had collapsed without warning. That was the way of things out here. You never knew when solid ground might crumble beneath your feet. Sawyer's grin broadened. Pay attention, Jackson. Things are about to get very interesting. 43. Jackson Cross. Day 6. Jackson stood on the dock, watching a few boats entering and exiting the harbor. The big tourist tours had been canceled. Handwritten signs on most of the shop doors stated, closed until further notice. He'd been on Sawyer's boat for less than two hours. It had felt like an eternity. The temperature was in the low 60s, but he was sweating, damp, wet circles beneath his armpits. The view was stunning. The white boats against the pristine green of the lake. Birds wheeled in the eggshell blue of the sky. A dog barked somewhere. Still, he felt the darkness pressing against him, insidious, invisible. How could you fight what you couldn't see? How could you stop a train thundering down the tracks? He could feel the vibrations beneath his feet, this terrible thing that was coming. Sawyer was right, in some ways. They could imagine, they could predict. They could prepare and warn and try to ready themselves. Thing was, no one knew how bad it would really get. Even here in paradise, in a place this isolated, there were shadows. Enemies, both seen and unseen, lying in wait, ready to rise up. Did he have what it would take to fight the encroaching darkness? Did any of them? Jackson's radio crackled. It was Devon. He hadn't had his radio with him on Sawyer's boat. He brought the radio to his mouth. What is it? I've been trying to raise you all morning, Devon said, breathless and alarmed. Couldn't get a signal. He tensed. What happened? Tourists reported an accident outside of Aw Train, off an old forest road near County Road 552 near Candle Creek, a crashed ATV at the bottom of a ravine. Jackson stopped breathing. Are there bumper stickers on the back? One says, I heart Paris. The other one is New York City, I think. Yeah, Devin said. That's the one. His heart contracted in his chest. That's Shiloh's. Is she hurt? Is she okay? We're doing a sweep of the woods. No sign of her yet. I sent Nash to check the hospital. But the ATV? Looks like a hit and run. Someone ran her off the road, boss. I'm on my way. He strode down the dock toward the patrol truck parked in the empty parking lot. I'll be there in ten minutes. Alarm flared through him. This was what he'd feared. A little girl, out in the world alone, where anything could happen. Jackson sped through town. There was far more traffic than usual. The cabins, hotels, and RV resorts were filling up. And not with Aurora chasers. Almost every vehicle he saw was an RV or a jeep or truck 
loaded with supplies. People were headed north, bugging out of the cities, planning to hole up and wait this thing out. His only thought was finding Shiloh. If something had happened to her, if she was dead, he'd never forgive himself. Ruts marred the dirt road. Overgrown weeds choked the shoulder. Tall jack pines, towering oaks, and slender beech trees crowded both sides of the road. The thick canopy cloaked the sun. A minute later, he pulled up behind Devin's car, leapt out, and approached the scene, careful to preserve potential evidence. To his left, the ravine dropped a good 40 to 50 feet. Birds twittered. The air cooled considerably this deep in the woods. Mosquitoes whirled in thickening clouds. Small flags marked a deep set of tracks along the shoulder. Judging by the size, the distance, the depth of the treads, they were from a pickup truck. The treads looked aggressive, like they were specialty off-road tires. Hopefully the tech guys could match them with a manufacturer, brand, and model. The tracks deepened and swerved where the truck had slammed its brakes to keep from hurtling over the precipice. A pair of narrow tracks were smeared beneath the larger tracks of the pursuing vehicle. His heart in his throat, he gazed down at the path of shattered underbrush that led into the ravine. Over here, boss, Devin called from below him. Her voice filtered through the dense trees. Come down slow. Watch your step. I fell twice. Bushes snagged at his windbreaker. Thorns clawed his pant legs. Damp leaves slid beneath his boots, threatening to send him sprawling. He used vines and branches to steady himself as he descended into the ravine. Two-thirds down, he caught sight of the ATV. The mangled wreck of the four-wheeler lay crumpled at the base of a poplar tree with low, spreading branches. He stared at it, his eyes blurring, imagining Shiloh crushed beneath it, battered and lifeless. He told himself not to care, not to become emotionally invested. It was impossible, especially with this case. It was that care that drove him, compelled him, forced him to work harder and longer, to refuse to give up. It also blinded him, haunted him, stalked his dreams and nightmares. She was thrown free, Devin said. She must have been. She stood ten yards away at the bottom of the ravine. She pointed. Got a few droplets of blood over here. Jackson stayed well clear of the scene, circling it cautiously, studying the ground, the matted tracks. Two pairs of prints, one smaller, one much larger. He didn't know if the larger prints matched the unknown prints found at the salvage yard. They needed to make plaster casts. Devin set an evidence marker next to the tree. She pulled an envelope from her pocket with gloved hands, swabbed a dark droplet on a section of bark about chest high, then placed the swab into the envelope and marked it. She circled the scene and approached the ATV again. Boot prints. Here and here. Jackson saw the same thing she did. Dismay nodded in his gut. He followed her down. He did. Not an accident. No. Devin squatted near the ATV's crumpled rear fender. The I Heart Paris bumper sticker was nearly unrecognizable. We've got paint transfer. She pointed to a faint blue streak, then pulled out her phone and photographed it. He'd given her one of the extra solar chargers he'd purchased in Marquette. She glanced up at him, frowning. We'll get our tech guys on it. They'll get a paint match. Together with the tires and prints, we'll find the perp who did this. Jackson felt impotent. They were the long arm of the law, but their hands were cuffed. The records are online, and online is offline. A blue jay perched on a branch 20 feet above their heads. He chattered angrily at them for invading the peace of his woods, his sanctuary. We'll have to do things the old-fashioned way. Devin swatted at a mosquito. Gotta start somewhere. Have you called it in? Can't reach dispatch. 
I had to drive back into town just to get within range to radio you. Their radios worked on a repeater system, essentially radio towers that required electrical power. With the repeater network down, their portable radios and in-car radios would only transmit and receive within a short range. Frustration surged through him. Damn it! I'll go in person. Looks like we're doing everything in person. What a colossal waste of time and resources. They climbed the ridge, feet sliding in the muddy leaves, breathing hard with exertion by the time they crested the ridge. Jackson walked back, studying the tire tracks along the shoulder. Devin watched him, her useless phone in one hand like an extra appendage, her other hand fisted on her hip. What is it, boss? A dark understanding slithered through him, a cold tingle at the back of his skull. Someone found her, hunted her down. She was a witness, like we thought. A 14-year-old boy couldn't do this. Devin studied the ground, the story it told. No, Cody Easton didn't kill his grandfather. Someone else did, Jackson said. And that someone came after Shiloh. Could be a coincidence. Someone running a girl off the road less than a week after her grandfather is murdered? It's not. Devin nodded slowly. They were both witnesses. And now they're both in danger. Jackson rubbed his temples and groaned. Why couldn't she just come to me like a normal kid? What the hell does she think she's doing? I can't protect her if I don't know where she is. Devin approached him and placed a hand on his arm, compassion in her eyes. I know you care about this kid, about both of them. We'll find them, okay? She's still out there. He couldn't breathe. She's hurt and scared and alone. Devin didn't blink. Yeah, she is. But we've got a lead. That's more than we had an hour ago. The perp doesn't know it, but he just gave us the clue we need to nail him. He forced himself to focus, to think. We find the truck. We find him. The early evidence had pointed at Cody. Clearly it wasn't him. And then Sawyer, but it wasn't him either. Eli Pope had still been in prison at the time of the homicide. So who, then? The puzzle pieces didn't fit. He felt like he'd been reading the scene wrong, the whole thing, going at it backward. He needed to figure it out, and fast. Shiloh and Cody's lives depended on it. Jackson shook off his sense of impending dread and steeled himself. Fred Combs owns the auto body shop off Adams Trail, near the Bear Trap Inn. The man is old as sin. If anyone keeps a filing cabinet around, it's him. Bet he knows every vehicle and every driver in the county. Devin's lips flattened into a thin line. He rarely saw her without a twinkle in her eyes, but there was no twinkle now. Only grim determination. Let's go. We'll take the patrol truck. We'll come back for your car later. We need to conserve gas. Get in the truck. Yes, boss the merest flash in her eyes. But I'm driving. 44. Lena Easton. Day 6. The fire in the sky flared brighter than Lena had ever seen it. Great swaths of burning crimson writhed like translucent snakes eating each other's tails. The aurora had never seemed more alive, heavenly wraiths pulsing with both beauty and menace. It took incredible focus to keep her eyes on the road, rather than stare gaping through the windshield. It was surreal, ethereal, almost supernatural. The Tanturd's radio spat static. Garbled nonsense erupted from every station. AM or FM, it didn't matter. From the back seat, Bear rose to his haunches and whined. He didn't like the noise. Lena didn't either. She switched it off. It's getting stronger, right? I'm not seeing things? Bear woofed. That's what I thought. She rubbed her weary eyes. It wasn't even dark yet, but the northern lights shimmered bright in the sky. 
Her stomach growled. Sweat broke out on her forehead. She felt a little shaky, too. Damn it, she'd forgotten to eat. So focused on driving that she'd missed her last meal break. She had to be careful. She couldn't afford to let her health slide. She checked her pump, then reached for an apple juice box and a package of crackers and cheese. Dinner of champions. She glanced at Bear in the rearview mirror. Don't judge. Even though she'd skirted the city, huge traffic jams outside of Detroit had slowed her down. She'd inched her way through Ann Arbor, where she'd attended the University of Michigan. Most of the exits were backed up. It appeared that everyone was attempting to leave at once. She couldn't imagine the state of things within the city itself. She'd passed dozens of vehicles marooned on the side of the road, out of fuel. Hotel parking lots were overflowing as stranded people found themselves desperate for shelter. On I-75, she drove through Flint and then Saginaw 40 miles later. The further north she went, the more the traffic thinned. A forest green station wagon drove ahead of her. She'd kept their tail lights in her sights for the last hundred miles. Gradually, cities and towns faded away. The trees grew taller and closer together as the familiar woodsy scent of northern Michigan hit her senses. It smelled like home. Who was she kidding? She had no home anymore. She'd abdicated the places of her childhood and fled, intending never to return. Yet here she was. Ten miles from Mackinac City. The nearly five-mile Mackinac Bridge separated the lower and upper peninsula, a stretch of steel that bridged two distinct worlds. A 23-hour, 1,600-mile drive had turned into four days. How much faster could she have traveled if she hadn't been alone, if she hadn't needed to stop frequently to tend to her blood sugar and care for Bear, if more gas stations had been functional? There were too many ifs, too many unknowns. She'd done the best she could. Trepidation snarled in her gut, her fingers taut on the steering wheel, her mouth dry. Once she crossed the bridge, she was 130 miles from her destination. She checked the fuel gauge. As long as she didn't hit another traffic jam, she'd make it. Bear gave an anxious whine. He stood in the back seat and nosed the window. She knew the Newfie like the back of her hand, knew his barks, woofs, head shakes, whimpers, and whines. He was nervous, concerned about something he could sense, but she couldn't. She slowed. What's wrong, boy? Before he could respond, a loud boom echoed, then another and another. Ahead of her, to the right, a power line exploded. Sparks flew. Smoke billowed, tinged red with fire. A second one, then a third. All down the line, flames and smoke and sizzling sparks exploded into the night. Lena gaped in astonishment. The station wagon slammed its brakes. It veered left, tires squealing as it skidded sideways and came to an abrupt halt in the center of the highway. Lena hit the brakes. The tan turd squealed in protest. Her seatbelt jerked against her chest as her body was thrown forward. Bear growled, nails scrabbling. His big body smacked the back of her seat. The SUV jerked to a jarring stop. Less than five feet of asphalt between the two vehicles. The tan turd was untouched. Relief flooded her. For a second she sat, stunned. As far as she could see, power lines sizzled and buzzed, pulsing with powerful surge after powerful surge. It lasted 15, maybe 20 seconds. It seemed to go on forever. Someone screamed. It was coming from the station wagon. A woman sat behind the steering wheel, staring straight ahead. Two kids were in the back seat. One pounded on the glass with tiny fists, mouth open. The aurora bathed their terrified faces in the red glow. Adrenaline icing her veins. Lena made a quick visual check of the road for downed power lines to ensure it was safe, then bolted into action. She leapt from the SUV, grabbed her medic bag from the back, and dashed to the driver's side of the Volvo. Several cars whizzed past driving onto the shoulder to avoid them. No one stopped. Most cars were full of suitcases and boxes. 
More and more people were getting the hell out of Dodge. She pounded on the window. The woman turned her head, blinking and dazed. She was in her early thirties, with short brown curly hair and scared eyes. When she noticed Lena, she unlocked the door. Lena opened it and peered inside. You okay, ma'am? I, I think so. Lena looked her over, checking for injuries or signs of shock, asking her a series of questions. She was alert, oriented, and unhurt, just startled. Normally, Lena would call 911 and get them to a hospital, just in case. That wasn't happening now. After checking with the woman, Lena offered the kids some fruit snacks, then gestured for her to step out of the vehicle. What? What just happened? The woman asked. The geomagnetic storm overloaded the transformers. It probably happened across the country. Do you have somewhere safe to go? We're on our way to my brother's house in St. Ignace. Get there as quickly as you can. The woman stared at her. Then she looked at the sizzling transformers and back to Lena. It's real, isn't it? It's really happening. It's real. I've been listening to the news every day. It's hard to know what to believe. But I thought it was better to be safe than sorry, so we left Atlanta. Good thinking. Buy whatever supplies you can, whatever's left. Lena held her gaze. Get ready for all hell to break loose. Protect your kids. Okay, the woman said, stealing herself. She straightened her shoulders, mopped her face, and glanced back at her children. Okay, I will. Lena got back in the tan turd. She watched the mother return to her vehicle and comfort her scared kids. They looked at her with total trust. Lena hoped they would be okay. There was no coming back from this. What came next would be pure chaos. Bear chuffed in her ear as she started the engine. Strap in, she told Bear. From here on out, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. 45. Jackson Cross. Day 6. The smell of motor oil and cigarette smoke wafted through the empty front office of Fred Combs' automotive body shop. Jackson scanned the waiting room, scratched linoleum, a couple of metal chairs, car magazines scattered across a coffee table. No secretary sat behind the yellowed counter. Behind the counter, a door, dented from decades of use, led to the shop. It was unlocked. Jackson and Devin let themselves in. Devon trailing behind Jackson. They maneuvered past bays with various vehicles on hydraulic lifts, stacks of tires, workbenches laden with tools, and a couple of rolling creepers shoved against the wall. The mechanic was leaning over a rusty jeep, the hood up, a wrench in one hand. A battery-operated lantern provided light. He turned as they approached. Nice to see you, Fred, Jackson said. What a want. Fred Combs was an old goat in his mid-seventies, with grease beneath his fingernails and liver-spotted hands. A halo of stiff white hair billowed around his head like Einstein. Devin showed him the wrecked ATV pictures on her phone and explained the situation. We were hoping that you could help us. He barely glanced at the phone. He spoke with a heavy, youper accent. Yeah? I got customers. They got cars and trucks in all sorts of colors. What's it to you, eh? We need a name and address of anyone who owns a vehicle in this particular color, that's all. He grabbed a grease-stained towel from the rolling table beside the Jeep, scattered with wrenches, screwdrivers, a socket set, and a drill. My customers appreciate their privacy, don't you know? I don't go around giving personal information like that. I might lose customers if word got out that I was doing that sort of thing. Jackson gritted his teeth. You want a murderer loose in the community? That affects everyone, even you. Combs scowled. We already got one. You ain't done jack squat to solve that problem, now have you? Eli Pope has been contained. He's not going to be an issue. Combs gave a disbelieving grunt. I'll believe that when I see it. 
damn redskins. Always up to no good. Jackson stiffened. What did you say? Nothing. Just like I got nothing to say to cops. Hostility radiated from the old man's every pore. Wrinkles radiated like spider's webs across his hard, leathery face. Jackson appreciated the benefits of life in a rural, isolated, half-wild place. Its insular nature, its privacy, that close familiarity, the safety of neighbors who would look out for one another. There were also folks who disliked authority, fiercely independent, used to doing their own thing. They wanted the government to stay the hell out of their business. Law enforcement were outsiders, even if they were their own sons and daughters. This perp ran a little girl off the road. Jackson got up in his face. Combs flinched, tried to back away, but the jeep prevented him. He had nowhere to go. He's still out there. Combs turned his head and spat tobacco on the oil-stained concrete floor. Just like your daddy, coming in here like you're owed, you're entitled. You and your family believe in you're above the law, that you make the law. You don't got everyone in this county in your pocket, Cross. He felt the ticking clock in his blood. He couldn't see the timer, didn't know where the bomb was, but he knew it existed. It was counting down. He was running out of time. They needed a break, just one little break. Helpless frustration flared through him. Investigating a case was difficult enough when the world worked as it should. With the DMV down, they had no way to search registered vehicles. It should be a simple matter to narrow it down. Instead, they were no further than before. This ornery knucklehead had the information they needed tucked inside his liver-spotted, frizzy-haloed skull, and he wouldn't give it to them. His hands clenched into fists, tendons standing out on his neck. I know, you know who owns that truck. Combs patted the breast pocket of his grease-stained overalls, like he was searching for a pack of cigarettes. I don't owe you a damn thing. Get the hell out. Jackson's frustration seethed into anger. It flashed hard and bright. He took a lunging step and jabbed his finger in the old man's chest. You know, damn it. You can help us, and you're refusing. You know this truck. There were answers here. The answer they so desperately needed. In that moment, he was willing to do anything to get what he needed what Shiloh needed. Tell me, he shouted into Combs' face. Spittle struck the man's whiskered cheeks. Who owns the damn truck? Combs' breath came in uneven wheezes. His weathered face reddened with anger. Yeah, sure. I know who owns that truck. I've got what you need. And you're never gonna get my help. How you like them apples, huh? Jackson stepped back, breathing hard. His anger had startled him, how fast it had surged. He lifted his hands, showed his palms to the old man, the best apology that he could muster. Combs gave him the finger. Get the hell out of my shop before I report you. It was an empty threat. He was old school, a man who took care of his own business and didn't want the aid of law enforcement. He wouldn't go crying to Sheriff Underwood. And he had no reason to. Jackson had controlled himself, if barely. Thank you for your time, Devin said sweetly. Don't come back, Combs snarled. Jackson stalked from the shop into the waiting area and shoved through the front doors into the cool late evening air. Devin followed him. His stomach grumbled, but he was too upset to eat. Besides, most of the restaurants were closed. There was no power. Generators were running out. No supplies had been delivered for days, either. They stopped on the sidewalk, halfway to the patrol truck. Sweat beaded his brow beneath his armpits. Dusk was falling. The aurora already danced in the sky, brighter than he'd ever seen it. 
Long, blood-red shadows stretched across the grass. He felt shaky. He needed the calm and quiet of a river and a fly fishing rod, some peace and time to think. But there was no peace to be had. Devin watched him. You okay, boss? I'm fine. His hands were trembling. He shoved them in his pockets. You got him angry enough to get us what we needed. Jackson shrugged, reluctant to admit how angry he'd been, too. He felt himself losing it, losing himself. The law was logical. It was cerebral. It was about following the rules. It offered control. But he did not feel in control. We have enough for a warrant, Devin said. You did good. Jackson nodded. We have probable cause. We know what he has and where it's located. He has material evidence in a felony assault investigation and is refusing to turn it over. Then let's go find a judge. Devin strode past him. I assume you have someone in mind? Jackson hurried to keep up. I do. 46. Lena Easton. Day 6. Lena drove up the winding driveway leading to Jackson's house. She'd barely made it. The gas gauge ticked at empty, the tan turd struggling with every mile as she passed the places of her childhood. The familiar roads, the forests that stretched for hundreds of miles. At last, the big stone house appeared at the top of the ridge. Behind it lay Lake Superior, glittering crimson as it reflected the northern lights. The aurora was so bright, it might have been sunset rather than 10 p.m. Jackson stood on the porch of his parents' house as if he'd sensed her arrival. He wore civilian clothes, faded jeans, and an Alice in Chains t-shirt, still with that boyish smile, that rumpled sandy hair. He looked older, though, and sadder like life had dealt him a nasty blow that he'd never recovered from. Her chest squeezed with long dormant affection. He lifted a hand and waved. Bear leapt from the back seat and trotted beside her as she made her way up the driveway. His tail wagged, excited to meet a new person, to make friends. Lena felt the same urgency. With every step, she felt herself returning to the past, rewinding time the months and years and days flashing past. Four best friends, laughing together, weeping together, arms entwined, a thousand memories of hot and sparkling summers, cold winters spent sledding, cross-country skiing and snowmobiling, huddled close before a warm fire, unspooling stories and songs and half-drunk dreams. They'd been her escape, as they'd been Lily's, each of them had found solace in the others for their own reasons, a solace none of them could find at home. It was the reason she'd come here first, instead of the rambling white farmhouse she'd grown up in. It would be empty and silent, her father dead and the kids missing. Lena paused at the top of the driveway, her feet rooted in place. Hey, you, she said. Jackson said, Hey, you back. With a grin, he bounded down the porch steps. His strong arms opened wide. He drew her into a bear hug. At first, she stiffened. Slowly, she allowed herself to melt into his arms. In his familiar embrace, the stress of the journey leaked out of her. He held on tighter, warm and strong and comforting, like a fuzzy blanket on a cold night. He had been her confidant, her best friend. They'd understood each other. Where things with Eli had been hot or cold, a roller coaster of love and heartbreak, Jackson had been calm, even, dependable, a lighthouse in the storm. Years of loneliness washed over her. How could she have forgotten how she'd missed this, missed him? She loved this man like a brother. Jackson, Lena. 
His chest vibrated against her cheek as he spoke. It's been a while. She choked out a half laugh, half sob. For the first time, in nearly a decade, she felt it. That pull. That connection to her soul she thought she'd lost. Maybe it had just been misplaced. She was the prodigal daughter, returned. I'm so glad you came, Lena. I really am. She pulled back and gazed up into his face. You look so old. He managed a tight smile. And you look the same as the day you left. How are things here? Better than out there, but not by much. Tell me you have Shiloh and Cody. His face fell. Not yet. We're getting close. We have a lead. The grid down is making everything harder. But this is my job. He squeezed her shoulders. I promise you, I will find them. I can help you, Bear and I. That's what we do. We find the missing. He smiled wearily. Get some rest first. You look exhausted. Stay here with my parents for the night. Tomorrow will bring enough troubles. I know. Jackson released her and took a moment to greet her dog. He bent on one knee and reached out a hand for the newfie to sniff. This must be Bear. Bear perked up. Tail wagging, he slurped the side of Jackson's face with his pink tongue. <laughs> well, hello to you too. I think he likes me. Don't get cocky. He likes everyone. Jackson patted Bear's fuzzy head, rubbed behind his ears, then rose to his feet. He frowned, looking her over. Your skin is pale. You feeling dizzy? Do you need to eat? We've got an unopened can of frosting inside. And apple juice. Still your favorite? Lena couldn't repress a smile. More than anyone, Jackson had been attentive to her illness, checking in on her, always with a juice box in his backpack if she needed it. She had forgotten how wonderful it felt to be known so well. Still my favorite. Thank you. They were just-in-case people, natural caretakers, the ones who ran toward danger head-on and never blinked. Jackson wanted justice to catch the bad guy, while Lena wanted to save everyone, even the unsavable. We have so much to catch up on, Jackson said. I want to know everything, Lena said. Neither of them mentioned Eli Pope. The wound was still raw and tender to the touch. That would come later. On the porch, the front door opened. Jackson went rigid as his mother wheeled his sister onto the porch. Well, hello, dear, Dolores said with a smile that appeared genuine. It's been so long. Come in, come in. I was just making dinner. Astrid eyed her. She was as pretty as Lena remembered, with her long, silky blonde hair and bright green eyes. Another mouth to feed. I thought we were rationing our food, Jackson. I can leave, Lena said quickly. She's staying. Jackson didn't turn around, didn't bother to look at his family. She's come a long way. Astrid pursed her lips and smoothed her shiny blonde hair. Then she smiled brightly. I guess you'll just make yourself at home, Lena. You always did. Astrid had never been anything but polite, and yet Lena had always felt that Jackson's little sister disliked her. She had the same slippery sensation now, but she forced a smile in return. Thank you for your hospitality. It'll only be tonight. Lena turned to Jackson. Do you have electricity? I've been powering the mini fridge with the car adapter, but the fuel tank is on empty. We have the generator. Bring your insulin inside. Jackson squeezed her arm like he could read her mind, could sense her anxiety ratcheting up. I promise, we'll figure it out. The tension released inside her like a closed fist opening. The stress and pressure and heartache the trials and struggles to get here. The rest of the world fell away. 
For the first time in four days, she felt at peace. Lena Easton was finally home. 47. Jackson Cross. Day 7. We got him, Devin said. Who is it? Jackson asked. After work yesterday, Jackson had stayed up far too late reminiscing with Lena. He was thankful she was back home and safe. Now it was time to get to work. It was time to catch a killer. Devin smiled and shoved her braids behind her shoulder. He's right here, sitting in an interrogation room. Jackson didn't breathe. Tell me. You're never gonna believe it. The county courthouse had closed yesterday. It had taken hours to physically track down a judge at a bar in Grand Marais, at the far corner of Alger County. The courts were a mess. Everything was a mess. The president had finally declared a national emergency. All systems were down across the country. Internet, cell service, GPS. FEMA had been deployed to dozens of large cities to provide food and water to a populace that was fast running out of basic needs. Despite the chaos, they'd caught a break. Once the warrant had been served, Fred Combs gave up the information they needed. The specific shade of blue paint color was Velocity Blue. It belonged to Ford Motor Company, starting with model year 2018. Fred Combs had three customers who owned a Ford F-150 in Velocity Blue, built between 2018 and the current year model. Daryl Harlow, a mailman in Shingleton. Susan Ashton Hutch, a married accountant in Chatham. And Calvin Fitch. Fitch was the proud owner of a Velocity Blue 2019 Ford F-150 Lariat, outfitted with a bull bar. According to Coombs' handwritten records, Fitch brought the truck in for regular oil changes and tire rotations. He'd purchased new Maxxis off-road tires two months ago. Coombs had scribbled in an appointment for this afternoon at 3 p.m., fender damage and paint match repair. Calvin Fitch would not make that appointment. Thirty minutes ago, Moreno and Hastings had picked him up from the middle school campus. Now, Fitch sat in an interrogation room like a fish caught on the line. A fish that could easily slip off the hook if they weren't careful. Sheriff Underwood stood next to Jackson, his hands behind his back, his features tense. What do we have on him? Alexis Chilton pushed her black framed glasses up the bridge of her nose and stared at her blank laptop screen like she wanted to beat it with a hammer. I can't access the state or federal databases, but Fitch is a janitor at an educational facility. He would have been fingerprinted and background checked for employment. A criminal history would have flagged him. What else? Jackson asked. Our internal server is still functional, for however long it lasts. A couple of speeding tickets in the last five years. He was picked up for loitering outside the Horseshoe Falls gift shop in 2019. The owner, Lydia Duncan, felt that he was watching her. It made her uncomfortable. She thought he was shoplifting, but the officers didn't find anything on him. That's not much, Hastings said. Any connection to the victim? the sheriff asked. None known for Easton, but he works at the kid's school, Jackson said. You find his truck yet? Devin shook her head. It's not at his listed address. Patrol visited the other two owners. Hastings laid eyes on both vehicles. No damage or scrapes, no sign of an accident. It could belong to a tourist, Moreno said. Unlikely, Jackson said. We've got Fred Combs' records. The Maxis Trepador off-road tires on Fitch's truck are special order. The casts at the scene look extremely close to a match. It would take more legwork to confirm with the manufacturer, which would take days, if not longer. It was enough for now. Fitch was good for it. This was it. He could feel it. What the hell is the motive? Sheriff Underwood asked, glowering at Jackson. We suspect he killed the victim, but didn't know that Shiloh was present. 
Somehow, he found out that she was a witness and tracked her down. He ran her off the road in an attempt to cover his tracks. The truck will connect him to the hit and run, but we've got nothing that connects him to Easton. Yet. You think this is him? Moreno asked. It's the best lead we have, Jackson said. It's weak, Sheriff Underwood said dismissively. The man looked like he hadn't slept in a week. They were all haggard, exhausted, and stressed. You're grasping at straws. He lawyered up yet, Jackson asked. He didn't ask, Moreno said. We said we needed his help, good citizen style. Good, let's keep it that way. Jackson glanced at Devin. You ready to take a crack at him? She nodded. Let's do this. Don't screw this up, son, Sheriff Underwood said darkly. We need a win. Jackson bit back a sharp retort. Even now, the sheriff was as condescending as ever. I'm well aware, sir. He ignored Sheriff Underwood's glare and straightened his shoulders. Anxious energy buzzed in his veins. His heart thudded, his mind a whir of questions and answers, as he prepared himself for a game of mental chess. The stakes were high, a murderer on the loose, two missing kids, the country balanced on the brink of disaster. Much as he resented it, Sheriff Underwood was right. They needed this win. Jackson and Devin removed their gun belts. Jackson entered the room first. Devin came in behind him, carrying a scant case file folder. The room was small, with white walls, a metal table bolted to the floor, and plastic folding chairs. There were no two-way mirrors, but microphones and cameras were embedded in the wall. The air smelled stale, like old coffee and body odor. The generator hummed. The fluorescent lights buzzed and flickered overhead. Fitch looked up with squinty eyes, fidgety and restless. Like the last time they'd seen him, he wore denim overalls with scuffed brown boots. His lanky, dun-colored hair looked unkempt. He hadn't shaved in days. Jackson scraped back the chair and took a seat. He leaned back, legs crossed, confident and calm, and faced Calvin Fitch. 48. Jackson Cross. Day 7. Devin took a seat beside Jackson. She set the file on the table and offered Fitch a disarming smile. Good morning. Fitch stared at her with suspicion and didn't respond. Devin spoke in a polite, soothing voice. If you work with us, clear up a few questions we have, we can get you out of here even faster. Fitch glanced at her, unsmiling. I didn't do anything wrong. We'd really appreciate your help. Jackson waved a hand absently. I apologize if you're uncomfortable. We're conserving our fuel so the air conditioner isn't running. He shrugged. It's fine. They needed to Mirandize him. It often caused suspects to shut down. But if there were questions about culpability, they needed to have their ducks in a row for the DA. There was nothing worse than getting a confession they couldn't use to nail the perpetrator in court. Calvin, we've got some questions we'd really like to know. Given the circumstances, I just need to read you your Miranda rights, since we don't know what you're going to tell us. Am I a suspect? Right now, we don't have any suspects. Devin gave an apologetic shrug. Unfortunately, that means we have to treat everyone as a suspect. Do I need a lawyer? This was tricky. Jackson kept his voice light, his expression neutral. You can talk to an attorney if you would like to, but it'll take a while for a public defender to get here. With phones down and everything that's going on, it could take hours. His expression darkened. Principal Kepford wants me to disinfect the classrooms while the students are home because of the power outages. 
It's a lot of work. We'll get you out of here as soon as possible, I promise. Jackson pulled a card from his pocket and read the required paragraph, though he had it memorized. Okay, Calvin, do you understand the rights as I've read them to you? Fitch picked at his nails. He looked nervous. Yeah, yeah, I understand. To begin, they asked him some easy softball questions. They wanted him to feel comfortable, to build a rapport with him. More importantly, Jackson was learning his style. How he reacted when he was calm and comfortable versus how he responded when he was under duress or being deceptive. Devin asked the questions while Jackson paid attention to how the suspect spoke, his body language, his facial expressions, and posture. You're still going to work, even though school is canceled? Devin asked. I'm impressed. Always stuff to do. Those kids, they leave everything a mess. No one knows how to clean up after themselves no more. He nodded to himself, stiff like his neck was attached to marionette strings. Did you see all those Transformers fry last night? Devin asked. Yeah. Crazy, right? If there had been any doubt before, there was none now. It would take months, likely years, to repair thousands of Transformers across the U.S., not to mention the damage to the satellites and communication systems. Yeah, crazy, Fitch mumbled. His wary gaze ping-ponged between Jackson and Devon. He shifted uncomfortably. The chair legs scraped the floor. I'm sure you've heard about the Easton homicide, Jackson said. Fitch folded his arms across his chest. He stared down at the table, frowning. Of course, everyone has. That convicted felon, the soldier, he done it, I heard. Devin offered an encouraging smile. We've heard things too, but we can't arrest people based on hearsay. We've got to dot our I's and cross our T's, you know? Fitch stared at her. As when they'd interviewed him at the school about Cody, he seemed slow. He took his time to answer questions. That dullness in his eyes. Was it a ploy? Plenty of calculated killers hid in plain sight. Maybe, Jackson allowed. We're eliminating suspects. It's arduous, but it's a necessary part of the process. Can you tell us what kind of vehicle you own? Devin asked. He didn't answer. A Velocity Blue Ford F-150 truck is registered in your name, she said. Model year 2019? That's a nice truck, Jackson said, acting impressed. Fitch hesitated. He uncrossed his arms, drummed his fingers on the table. What's it to you? Don't see how that's any of your business, anyway. Jackson kept his expression nonchalant, fighting his impatience. We're just asking a few questions, that's all. And then you can be on your way back to work, Devin said. We're truly sorry for the inconvenience. The apology did the trick. He'd expected an interrogation, not contrite deputies with rueful smiles. He blinked. Okay, yeah, sure. I have a truck like that, but I didn't do nothing with it. I'm sure you didn't. But can you tell us where it is? Jackson asked. I don't want no trouble. No one said that you're in trouble, Jackson said. He wanted to keep him talking. The last thing they wanted was a demand for legal representation. If he asked for a lawyer, the interview was over. Fitch glanced at the clock, enmeshed in wire on the far wall. It was frozen at 6.06 p.m. There was an accident, Devin said. Well, I don't know anything about an accident. A hit and run. An ATV was run off the road near County Road 552. Well, I didn't do that. We have to ask questions to help us figure out who did, Devin said. 
a little girl was riding that ATV. She got hurt. Fitch tensed. I don't know nothing about that. You're mistaken. It wasn't my truck. We know that it's your truck, Jackson said softly. We checked the mechanic's records to the tire treads at the scene. We confirmed it's a match. There were rules about deceiving suspects. A ruse was permissible as long as they didn't fabricate false evidence. Fitch paled. I don't know nothing about that. Why don't you start by telling us what happened, Jackson said. Fitch inhaled shallow breaths. He rubbed his hands together, blinking hard. Maybe you didn't even see her, Jackson said. That road is dark. Or maybe a deer ran out in front of you. It's understandable. Accidents happen. Fitch shook his head faster and faster. No, it wasn't me. I didn't do anything. Do you know where your truck is, Fitch? Devin asked. Maybe it was stolen. Look, we want to help you, Devin said. But you've got to be straight with us. We'll be honest with you if you can be honest with us. He licked his lips, eyes darting everywhere but at Devin and Jackson. I, I don't know. I don't know where it is. We need your help to eliminate you, okay? Jackson leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. Can you tell us where you were on Thursday night? I don't know. You can't remember? Think about it. He wrung his hands. His eyes were glazed, dull and scared, like a cornered animal. He was afraid, and he hated them for his fear. Let's figure this out together, Devin said. I'm sure it's a misunderstanding. I was at the Northwoods Bar, okay? All night, I had four or five Jack Daniels, maybe six. Played some pool with Cyrus Lee and Jay Addison. Tim Brooks was the bartender. You can ask him. He'll remember me. Neither Jackson nor Devin made a move. Outside the room, an officer would be leaving right now, headed for the bar to verify Fitch's story. Were you intoxicated when you drove home? Devin asked. He nodded, jaw clenched, angry at them for dragging it out of him. I'll lose my license for a year if I get another ticket, okay? How did you get to the bar? Jackson asked. I drove. You drove your truck? Devin asked. He hesitated. His right eye ticked. Yeah, of course. Jackson said, are you sure? Fitch looked guilty, like the kid caught with his hand in the cookie jar. I took the jeep. Wasn't supposed to, but I should get to go where I want, too. What jeep? Devin opened the file, perused the scant paperwork. You don't have another vehicle registered in your name. Jackson closed his eyes. He recalled the Jeep Wrangler parked in the school parking lot. A blue F-150 had been parked next to it, too. He'd just reviewed the in-car footage from his patrol truck last night. His heart began to pound. Why were you driving a Jeep instead of your truck? Devin asked. I wasn't driving the truck that night. I didn't do nothing. Fitch stared at them, belligerent. He was about to clam up. He was about to demand a lawyer, and they would lose him right when they were so close. The pieces were falling together, a terrible picture taking shape. Jackson leaned in, hiding the urgency crackling through him. I believe you, Calvin. We believe you. You lent it to someone. You were being a good friend. You didn't know what would happen. Yeah, a friend, okay? A friend had it. Devin's eyes narrowed. Then who? Who had it? Sweat beaded Fitch's broad forehead. I'll get in trouble. 
Devon offered him a sympathetic, doe-eyed look that could have melted the hardest of hearts. We're trying to get you out of trouble. Dismay curdled in Jackson's stomach. Alarm bells went off in his brain. He knew. He knew what Fitch was hiding. He just needed him to say it aloud. We need a name. Fitch shook his head. One nail was bleeding. He sucked at his thumb, eyes wide with fear. No, I can't. A name, Calvin. Jackson stood, scraped back his chair, and went to the door. Fitch's eyes followed his every move. Jackson opened the door and gestured, as if Fitch could stand up and walk through it, easy as pie. It's that simple. You can go home, right now, today. Fitch's posture collapsed. Whatever internal battle he'd had with himself, it was over. He lowered his head, the wings of his shoulder blades hunched inward. He mumbled something indecipherable. Devin frowned. Say it again? My cousin, Fitch said in a defeated voice. Walter Boone. 49. Shiloh Easton, Day 7 Shiloh's ankle hurt like hell as she rode into town on Eli's bike. Luckily, it wasn't sprained. Eli had tended the worst of her wounds. She'd slept the whole next day and the next night. Then, that morning, she'd stolen his mountain bike. Technically, she'd borrowed it. She planned to give it back. Eli had been awake when she'd left anyway. The man never slept. She'd almost told him about the man in the black boots. Almost showed him the photo of the girl she'd stolen from underneath Calvin Fitch's bed. Almost, but not quite. A lifetime of mistrust was a hard thing to overcome. Her whole life, she'd been alone, except for Cody. Still, Shiloh recognized when she was in over her head. The time she'd spent recovering at Eli's campsite had clarified things in her mind. She had clues that law enforcement needed. The plan was to drop off the envelope at the sheriff's office or the police station. Maybe leave it with the front desk and tell them to give it to Jackson Cross. On second thought, they could have wanted posters out for her. As soon as she showed her face, they'd grab her. Not a good idea. She'd drop it off, then run. She turned onto Main Street in Munising. The bike was too big for her, but she could handle it. Her crossbow she'd left back at the cave, though she hated to do it. It was incognito time. It was 60 degrees at 10 a.m., perfect weather for her navy blue hoodie, the hood drawn over her face, her black hair in a ponytail. With her features in shadow, along with the baggy sweatshirt and loose jeans, she could pass for a boy. There were tons of cars in town. Lots of folks packed the Dollar Tree and Dollar General parking lots, the grocery store, and the hardware store. The Munising Public Library was still open. The parking lot was empty. Shiloh biked into the lot, parked the bike near the entrance, and limped in. Her ankle throbbed when she put weight on it. Other than the librarian, Shiloh was the only person there. Guilt pricked her for mutilating the magazines, hiding behind a corral as she cut out the letters and words she needed and glued them onto a plain piece of paper, items she'd borrowed from the librarian. No one needed Cosmo or good housekeeping, not when things were normal, and certainly not now. Using the magazines, she'd written what she knew, the photos under the bed, the blue truck, the black boots. Then she placed the photo of the girl in an envelope. On TV, detectives could figure out your handwriting. She was careful. She wouldn't get caught. You're the first person I've seen in three days, the librarian said as Shiloh stacked a few reference books on the counter. The librarian checked out the books with paper and pencil, using a Coleman lantern for extra light. Mrs. Grady was a trim, attractive woman in her late 40s, who wore flowy, colorful skirts and billowy peasant blouses, her long, silver-streaked hair in braids. Mrs. Grady peered at the books, 
A Dummy's Guide to Homesteading, and Edible Plants. You're gonna start a garden, huh? Everyone should. I have a feeling you might be right. Why don't you close like everybody else? The librarian gave her a probing look. People still need books. For entertainment, but for learning, too. With everything going on, they've forgotten, but they'll remember again. When their phones die. When they can't stand the blank screen of their TVs and laptops any longer. She gave a grim smile. They'll be back, and I'll be here. Mrs. Grady knew who Shiloh was, but she didn't seem the type to listen to police scanners or turn in recalcitrant runaways against their will. Shiloh and Cody had spent more than their fair share of time here after school, sometimes even during school hours when they felt like cutting or when their grandfather had been drinking too much. Mrs. Grady never turned them in, never said boo about it to anyone. One time he'd come in searching for them, drunk and ranting. Shiloh had been sitting cross-legged in the fantasy section, Cody on the computers in the corrals, researching drawing contests. Mrs. Grady had threatened to call the cops, real loud, and in front of everyone. Then, after he'd stormed out empty-handed, Mrs. Grady had brought them Twix candy bars and bottled waters. Shiloh had loved her ever since. Shiloh slipped the books into her backpack and shoved the straps over her shoulders. She'd forgotten her library card. Mrs. Grady hadn't even cared. Thanks, Mrs. Grady. I'll return them next week. Mrs. Grady peered at her over the counter. You okay, honey? Self-conscious, Shiloh touched her swollen lip. She smiled, though it hurt. You should see the other guy. Mrs. Grady looked pensive. Her hair was messier than usual. Her eyes were red, like she'd been crying. For a second, it seemed like she was going to say something. Maybe, I'm sorry for your loss, blah, blah, blah. She didn't. You're taking care of yourself? Shiloh drew herself to her full height. Damn straight. You can always come here, honey. I hope you know that. I'll keep this place open as long as I can. As long as I'm still breathing. A surge of emotion warmed her chest. Her cheeks went hot. Shiloh blinked rapidly, spun on her heel, and limped from the library. No use trying to speak with her throat tight and this damn wetness in her eyes. She hopped awkwardly on Eli's bike, turned right from Munising Avenue onto Lynn Street, and headed toward the sheriff's office. The bay shimmered in the sunlight between the buildings. The sky was a perfect blue, not a cloud in sight. She parked a block down, wound the bike chain around a lamppost, and locked it. The rest of the storefronts were closed. Maggie's boutique had a sign that read, Open, no matter what, cash only. Though no one stood behind the counter. The touristy knickknacks, hats, magnets, keychains, and racks of sunglasses looked untouched. Shiloh kept close to the building overhangs in the shadows. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end. It felt like everyone was watching her. What if he was out here? In a car, on the street, in one of the shops, peering at her through a darkened window. He could be anywhere. Could be anyone. Following her right now. She didn't know him, didn't know his face. Terror scythed through her. The invisible monsters were the worst kind. She wanted to see evil, to fight it face to face. Footsteps echoed behind her. Her heart leapt into her throat. She flinched, whipped around. Behind her, a couple hurried up the sidewalk. The woman wore hiking gear with a pink gaiter around her neck. The man had a beard, his blonde hair tied back in a ponytail. They both wore heavy-duty hiking backpacks. What are we going to do? The woman said. I can't get stuck here. I've got to get home. I've got kids. I know, okay? Everyone knows. We'll figure something out. They passed Shiloh and hurried toward the corner gas station, where a dozen vehicles crammed into every available inch of asphalt. A red minivan blocked the road in front of the gas station, like they'd run out of fuel before reaching the promised land. Cars honked at each other. Her stomach growled. 
While she waited to cross the street, she tugged a Snickers bar out of her pocket, ripped off the wrapper with her teeth, and ate it. Chocolate stuck to her fingers, and she licked it off. Another car idled past. A white Jeep with muddy tires, splatters of muck gunked to its undercarriage and fenders. It coasted to a stop and pulled to the curb, not twenty feet ahead of her. The license plate was covered in mud, too. The Jeep driver switched off the engine. The driver stepped out, pocketed his keys, shoulders hunched as he headed for the hardware store. Several people hurried out the double front doors, clutching wood two-by-fours, rolls of plastic, tarps, and various tools. Shiloh froze mid-bite. She forgot how to breathe. Her eyes were glued to his feet. Black work boots, white stitching, red laces. A dull roar filled her ears. He wasn't driving the blue truck, but it didn't matter. It was him. 50. Shiloh Easton, Day 7. Outside the hardware store, the man stopped, still turned away from Shiloh. Panic clawed at her throat. A loud roaring sound filled her ears. New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia. Tasmania, Victoria, Western Australia. She forced herself to calm down, to breathe. Gradually, sound returned. Keeping to the shadows, she looked down the street. The man in the boots still held the front door open, chatting with another customer. Their words were muffled and indistinct, but the tone was friendly. They knew each other. The customer wore a blue police officer's uniform. He was tall with dark hair. His hands rested on his belt. She recognized him. He'd been at her house with all that crime scene tape. The cop laughed. The man in the boots slapped his shoulder and chuckled, then entered the hardware store. The door swung shut behind him. The terrible truth sank in. This monster was friends with cops. Hell, maybe he was a cop himself. She wasn't safe with the police or the sheriff's office. She never had been. Jackson couldn't help her. She couldn't trust him or any of them. Walking into that police station was tantamount to surrender. And Shiloh Easton did not give up or back down. Not ever. It wasn't in her blood. On wooden legs, Shiloh retrieved her bike and found a hiding spot around the corner of the alley between the bakery and the flower shop. There, she waited, breathless and tense. Anxiety torqued through her. This was too big. She should find Eli. She didn't trust any adults, except for Eli. But he was too far away. The jeep was here, now. The license plate was covered in mud. She had to follow it, or he would get away. She would follow him all the way down the rabbit hole. Twenty minutes later, the man in the boots exited the hardware store, carrying a shovel and a folded brown tarp beneath one arm. Shiloh crouched, peering around the corner. He glanced down the street at the closed gas station, gave a sharp shake of his head, and got into his vehicle. She listened to the engine rumble to life. Shiloh mounted the bike, hands gripping the handlebars, one foot on the pedal, ready to go as soon as the white jeep rolled past. A moment later, it did. Dread scrabbled up the knobs of her spine. Every cell in her body screamed at her to do the opposite of what she intended. Follow the monster to his lair. It was the only way. For a few blocks, she kept it within sight. The jeep drew further and further away. It swung a left off M28. Bicycling as fast as she could, she reached the intersection and jerked the handlebars left. The bike skidded, tires biting asphalt. She nearly lost control, but righted herself. Her ankle throbbed, her muscles aching in protest. A dot of movement far ahead, a glint of sunlight on the metal roof, the engine already fading. She rode as hard as she ever had, teeth clenched, jaw grinding, furious with herself, with the bike, with her own mortal helplessness. It wasn't enough. No way could she bike as fast as he could drive. 
By the time she reached the next intersection at Jasper Avenue, the jeep had completely disappeared. She craned her neck and looked left, then right, then left again. It was gone. She'd lost it. Angry, defeated tears stung her eyes. Coasting to a stop, she screamed at the sky, You stupid, maggot-riddled piece of dog- A lawnmower growled down the street. Crows chattered from the branches of a maple tree growing next to the stop sign to her right. No other sounds, but the steady whir of insects and her own ragged gasps. Dismay filled her. She could feel her brother slipping away. His smile, his touch. Even the memory of him was fading, like she didn't deserve to remember him. All those times he'd rescued her, saved her, stood between her and her grandfather's fists. This one time, this once, when he needed her, she was failing him. She closed her eyes, breathing deeply. Anchorage, Alaska. Nassau, Bahamas. She pictured her maps in her head, all the paths converging to lead to her brother. If only she could suss out the correct one. If only she were smart enough, clever enough, brave enough. Balanced on the bike in the middle of the road, she forced herself to breathe, to think. She thought of the clues, the pictures hidden beneath the bed, the blue truck, the boots the empty trailer. In her mind, she walked through the trailer again, cataloging everything. The birding books. The photo of Calvin Fitch with his arm slung around that man with the familiar bearded face she still couldn't quite place. The one that had snagged her attention before she'd remembered the cat box beneath the bed. Calvin Fitch, arm in arm with that familiar man the man who'd driven the white jeep. They'd been squinting, sun in their faces, an old clapboard cabin behind them, rotting in warped wood, weeds everywhere, vines climbing up one side, an old hunting cabin. Her breath caught in her throat. Steadying the bike, she unslung her backpack and unzipped it, rifling through her stuff until she pulled out her topographical map and the DNR State Forest Roads map of the area. Studying it, her brow creased, head tilted. The Hiawatha National Forest boasted over 2,000 miles of state forest roads for recreational riding. She traced a line with her finger from the cross section she stood at along Jasper Avenue all the way north to a network of forest roads. There were several derelict cabins scattered along that route. She and Cody had found most of them on their explorations. There was access from the Elderberry Trail, an isolated snowmobiling trail that passed behind her grandfather's property. She and Cody rode their ATVs on that trail sometimes. She knew it well, and she knew how to get there. She knew these woods, the hills and trails, the forest roads and wild miles of shoreline. She shielded her hand over her face and looked west. It was possible. Maybe more than possible. He might be at one of those cabins. He might not. She set her jaw. She'd return to her cave and gather what she needed. And then she'd check every nook and cranny, unearth every rock and climb every mountain, descend into every hole in the whole damn world if that was what it took. If that was the price fate demanded of her, she would pay it. 51. Jackson Cross. Day 7. Jackson and Devon stood in Walter Boone's empty house. Sunlight streamed through the windows. The house was too quiet. An eerie silence Jackson was getting used to. No HVAC unit switched on and off. No low hum of the refrigerator. No ticking clock in the kitchen. Without electricity, the world was fast transforming into a place of quiet desperation. Boone's address was listed as a small yellow cottage in Autrain off Woodland Road, 15 minutes west of Munising. 
Moreno and Hastings had gotten a warrant and were searching Fitch's trailer. No one had known that Fitch and Boone were cousins on their mother's side. Jackson had seldom seen them together, though they both worked at the Munising Middle School. Technically, Fitch did. Boone was a volunteer. Boone's tiny house looked pretty as a picture. Neat and clean, the bed made. Towels hung on the rack in the bathroom, knickknacks on the end tables, a glass coffee table stacked with books, a birder's guide to Michigan, and the American Birders Association Field Guide. Jackson recalled the binoculars hanging on the hook in Boone's office at the middle school. There were no pictures anywhere, no other personal artifacts, no signs of life. Boone found the body, Devin said. He must have returned to the crime scene to give a valid reason for the presence of his prints. It looks like it, but why? What's his motive to kill Easton? And where the hell is he? They only had parts of the puzzle. It was maddeningly unclear. Jackson riffled through the kitchen cabinets, the usual plates, bowls, glasses, silverware, and pots and pans in the drawers. The pantry was empty, but for some spices and a can of kidney beans. Does it feel like no one actually lives here? I'm getting that vibe. Devin stood in front of the fridge. Ready? Brace yourself. She opened the fridge. No foul odor from three-day-old rotting food assaulted them. Bottled water and some mustard. She sounded disappointed. The freezer was equally barren. Maybe he cleaned it out once the power went out. Maybe. Devin sounded dubious. He's lived here for 15 years. It's so... Sterile, Jackson finished. Right. Well, if he's not here, then where is he? They stared at each other. The unanswered question immense in the unnatural silence. Jackson rubbed his jaw in frustration, turning in a circle. He had that feeling again, a cold tingle at the back of his skull. They were close, so close. What the hell are we missing? Just then, Moreno pulled in, driving fast. His tires kicked up dust. He exited the patrol truck and hoofed it up the porch into the house, panting. We found something at Fitch's trailer. Spit it out, man, Jackson said. His eyes darkened with anger. Polaroid photos of teenage girls. Fitch admitted that Boone kept them at his trailer. Boone moved in with him, pitched in with the rent, but kept his official address here. How do we know the pictures aren't Fitch's? Devin asked. We'll test for fingerprints, but for now, we know this much. Boone is in some of them. The truth struck Jackson like a jackhammer to the chest. All along, they'd focused on Easton as the primary victim. Amos had been contentious, unlikable, a belligerent drunk. It had been an easy assumption to make. But Amos hadn't been the target. He was the collateral damage. The kids had been the targets from the beginning, either Shiloh or Cody, or both. He had been wrong about everything. It's him. He's the one. He knows we're on to him, Devin said. Wherever he is, he's got hours on us, Moreno said. The owner of the hardware store, Danny Ellison, says Boone stopped in around 11 a.m. That's the last time anyone has seen him. Not long after we picked up Fitch, Devin said. A chill raced up Jackson's spine. He set his cousin up to be his canary in the coal mine. He knew we'd suspect Fitch first. We'd sniff Boone out eventually, but he'd get the warning when we got to Fitch. Devin cursed. There's more, Moreno said. Nash talked to the librarian, Mrs. Grady. Once he relayed the seriousness of the situation, she admitted that she'd seen Shiloh Easton this morning in town, just before 11. Jackson stopped breathing. 
Boone could have seen her. It's possible. We need boots on the ground, now. Everyone we can get. We need badges checking every vacation rental, every hotel, every campground. Damn it, Devin said in frustration. No phones. You'll have to track them down, one by one. Go to Chief Erickson's house if he's not at the precinct. Find Sheriff Underwood. Get who you can on the radio. See if Hastings can drive to the Sioux and get Steve Rickshaw, the Chippewa County Sheriff. Devin nodded, shoulders tense, expression grim. Marino shook his head. Everyone is tied up with the crisis at the locks. They called in everyone, the state police, the Coast Guard. A riot broke out this morning. People are trying to get at the supplies in the containers stuck in transport. I need to find Shiloh, Jackson said. This maniac ran her off the road. If he thinks she can ID him, and that we're on to him, he'll be hunting for her. Devin shot him a look. If you've got any aces up your sleeve, now is the time to play them, boss. Devin was right. His nerves were frayed. Fear pushed him to the edge. Eli Pope knows where Shiloh is. I know he does. Enough with the games. I'm getting answers, or so help me, I will shoot him myself. Devin's eyes widened. You sure about this? He'd never been less sure in his life. He knew only that a little girl was in grave danger. Shiloh and Cody were counting on him. If that meant he'd have to climb into bed with the devil to save her, then so be it. Do you know where he is? Jackson headed for the door. I know him. I know where he'd go. I can find him. Devin reached out and grabbed his arm. Concern flashed in her eyes. Jackson, I'll do everything I can. I swear it. Everything might not be enough. He didn't say the words aloud. It would be challenging fate, an admission to the universe that he doubted. That in the end, his faith might fail him. He gave her a grim nod. Take me back. Devin dropped him off at the sheriff's office. She took the patrol truck and he switched to his Chevrolet Silverado 1500, but not before collecting supplies he might need in his search. More ammo, his Remington shotgun, and county-issued AR-15, some flashbang grenades, and a pair of NVG binoculars. He drove 30 miles over the speed limit, reckless, taking corners too fast, running stop signs. The passing seconds and wasted minutes felt like grains of sand passing through the hourglass. Only so many grains of sand, only so much luck. Jackson was fast running out of both. 52. Jackson Cross, Day 7. It took an hour to reach Eli's campsite from the nearest trailhead. Jackson had suspected where he might go. He knew he'd been right when he discovered the tripwire. If he hadn't been looking, he would have stumbled right over it. This place had once been Jackson's favorite spot, too, before Eli had gone and ruined everything. So many memories had been made here. Eli and Jackson fly fishing, whiling away the summers at the swimming hole with the girls, the beach upstream where they'd built the fire pit and watched the stars while they drank to ward off the despair crouched at the edges of their lives. He heard Lily's effervescent laugh, saw a bare-chested Eli plunge through the river, grab her around the waist and pull her under. How Lily had looked at Eli with naked adoration, ardent desire. How Eli had looked back. Jackson had watched them, sitting on the flat rock beside Lena, who had been sunbathing. Eyes closed, a backward baseball cap over her face. Jealousy had curled in his stomach like a snake eating its own tail. Lena hadn't seen a thing. He remembered Eli holding Lily beneath the water, the bubbles streaming, the water disturbed as she thrashed. Eli, Jackson had said, what are you doing? Eli looked up, his eyes dark, face unreadable. Jackson half rose. Eli, let her go. 
Eli released her and swam a stroke backward. Lily came up, sputtering. Her arms pinwheeled as she gasped. Water streamed down her face. Tendrils of chestnut hair stuck to her cheeks, her forehead. You jerk, she screamed. Eli's expression darkened. He'd stalked from the river, hands clenched at his sides, water streaming from his shoulders, his chest. Eli! Lily had called after him, still in the lake. She smiled, pushed her wet hair back from her face. In only an instant, she'd gone from angry to charming, tantalizing. Everything always a big joke. Don't be mad. Come back. She wanted to see how long she could go, Eli had muttered as he'd strode past Jackson. She told me to. Lena sat up, groggy. What's going on? But it was already over. It had only been a moment. Jackson had felt it, though. A frisson of doubt and fear at what Eli might do, what he was capable of. He'd hated himself for it at the time. Later, that memory had haunted him. Jackson blinked and shoved the painful memories down deep. It was one of many when it came to Eli, to Lily, to those sun-drenched moments that hinted of the shadows to come. The campsite was empty. I know you're here, Jackson said loudly. With one hand on his sidearm, he surveyed the scene. The Dakota fire pit, the log for seating, the tent in the center of the clearing. The ground swept clean of footprints. To his left, a couple of damp shirts hung over a fishing line stretched between two trees. Blue jays twittered in the trees. Thirty feet to his right, the river burbled over moss-strewn boulders. The clear water sparkled in the dappled sunlight. A heron strutted in the shallows. It watched him, wary, ready to take flight if he made a sudden move. Enough with the games, he said. Come on out. Something struck him in the back of the head. He spun around. An acorn lay on the ground behind him. He felt Eli's presence, though he couldn't see him. Like a cool touch on the back of his neck, a ghost walking across your grave. The hairs on his arms stood on end. Got you, Eli said. It was a game they had played a million years ago. Jackson would try to sneak up on Eli and nail him with an acorn or a pebble. He'd never managed to hit him. Eli had known every time. Jackson couldn't see Eli. He was hidden somewhere within the cover of the tree line, blended into his surroundings. Anxiety ate at him, but it was too late to back down. He was pot committed. He kept his hand on the butt of his service pistol. His pulse thudded in his ears, but he didn't reveal his nervousness, his desperation. Like any predator, Eli could sniff out weakness. Come out, Eli. Ten yards away, a shadow moved among denser shadows. Eli appeared from between two cottonwoods. He wore a homemade ghillie suit, twigs and leaves woven into netting over his back, shoulders, and head. Black mud streaked his skin beneath his eyes. His feet were spread, shoulder-width apart, the butt of an AK-47 pressed to his shoulder, the barrel aimed at Jackson's chest. He looked, every inch, the skilled killer that he was. Jackson had expected the hostile reception. Didn't mean he cared for a weapon pointed at him. Put the gun down, Eli. I would. But how do I know you won't shoot me? I seem to recall a promise to that effect. You're going to have to trust me. Eli guffawed. Startled, the heron took flight in a flurry of wings. Across the river, a squirrel scolded them from the branch of a jack pine. I'm here to ask for your help. There's a bald-faced lie if I ever heard one. You're going to have to do better than that, friend. It's not a lie. It's not a trick. Heard that before. Jackson stared down the barrel of the AK-47, his heart pumping. He was painfully aware that Eli knew a hundred ways to kill a person, none of them using a bullet. Please put that away. Forgive me, 
for not taking you at your word. Damn it, Eli, stop playing games. The only one playing games is you. Shiloh is in danger. A brief silence. Eli's expression didn't change. His Ojibwe features were sharp as a blade, black eyes glittering like obsidian. Did you hear me? You're barking up the wrong tree, as usual. He paused. Unless you're here to plant more evidence. Jackson didn't flinch. He knew he had it coming. I'm here for Shiloh. I don't know where she is or what she's doing. I don't care. You're lying on both counts. Good thing I don't care what you think. She came to you. Eli didn't answer for a moment, as if deciding whether to continue the deception or start playing straight. Jackson needed him to play straight. I care for Shiloh, Eli. I care what happens to her. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm asking for your help. I have nowhere else to turn. What makes you think I would help you? Jackson licked his dry lips. Somewhere down deep in that black soul of yours, you have a soft spot for Lily's daughter. I don't know why. I despise the thought of her anywhere near you. My back is against the wall. I don't have a choice. Eli didn't lower his weapon. Something crossed his features. A hint of concern. You helped her after the accident. Eli didn't deny it. Is she hurt? Banged up. No broken bones. Anger thrummed through him. And you didn't take her to the hospital? I patched her up. The hospital would have notified social services. She was terrified. Eli's mouth hardened. Her injuries were superficial. Jackson looked around the campsite. Where is she now? She stayed with me for two nights. Then she did her thing and disappeared. She's flighty. Has trust issues. Remind you of anyone? Jackson ground his teeth in frustration. Eli! She's fine. Except that she isn't. Jackson had to push past Eli's defenses. Get him to see how high the stakes were. That they mattered to Eli, too. I know you didn't kill Easton. Neither did Sawyer or Cody. Someone else did. Eli studied him. We had it wrong. I had it wrong. It's Walter Boone. I still don't know why he was after Cody, but he was. We think Cody was the target, not Amos. Shiloh witnessed it. I'm listening. He knows about her. He tried to run her off the road and clipped her four-wheeler. We found it a mangled wreck off that old forest road near County Road 552, near Candle Creek. Eli's eyes darkened. Jackson caught it. A flicker of anger, a shadow there then gone. We can't find Boone. Eli stilled. What do you mean you can't find him? He's not at his house. Looks like he hasn't been there for a while. We can't get access to his financial records, credit cards, or phone logs, because every system is down. He's in the wind. You think he knows you're onto him? Yes. And that he's going after Shiloh. Fear churned in his belly. Yes. He doesn't know where she is. No one does. You do. And we don't know that. Not for certain. He could have followed her. He could have picked her up in town, on the trail, anywhere. Eli's face remained impassive. Jackson couldn't tell what he was thinking. He seldom could, even when they were best friends. This man is dangerous. We think he already got to Cody. Whether that boy is dead or he's being kept somewhere, I don't know. If Shiloh thinks Walter Boone has her brother, what do you think she's going to do? It didn't need to be said aloud. They were both thinking it. That feral, half-wild child would set out on her own. She would not ask for help. She had courage, but she was also reckless and would get herself killed trying to be brave. Eli's eyes flicked to the campsite. He scanned their surroundings, hardly moving. 
His gaze roamed constantly, his muscles bunched and tense beneath his ghillie suit. Where are your fellow officers, he asked. Shouldn't they be searching every square inch of this place? Turning over rocks to see what's squirming underneath, arresting innocent people? They're otherwise occupied. Phones are down, communications screwed to hell. Servers disrupted all over the country, half the planet. There's a riot at the locks. The Sioux Locks in Sault Ste. Marie was the world's busiest lock system. Over 85 million tons of cargo passed through the 21-foot drop between Superior and Huron on freighters. There were goods on those cargo ships that people wanted. Badly. So, Eli said. There are more riots downstate in Detroit and Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo. People getting scared, starting to panic, realizing the government won't be able to save us all. The world is going to hell. Yeah, looks like maybe it is. But I still have a job to do, and that job is to apprehend Boone for the homicide of Amos Easton. I intend to do that, but Shiloh is my priority. Jackson cleared his throat. I promised her mother on her grave. Not that you would understand that. He took a breath, struggling to tamp down his anger, his frustration, his desperation. He could feel slender threads of hope slipping through his fingers. Shiloh is more important than either of us. That we can agree on. If you care about her, then you have to help me find her. She's a little girl and she trusted you. Do not let her down. A tense minute passed. Eli didn't move. He might have been a statue. No emotion on his face. No twitch in those rock-steady hands holding the AK-47. Jackson knew his mind was worrying, examining the angles, looking for traps. He had the unsettling sensation that Eli wasn't looking for a trap as much as setting one of his own. One for Jackson. The two of them, alone in the woods, no cell service. He was the undersheriff of Alger County. He was about to head into the remote wilderness with a former elite tier one soldier, a convicted killer, a killer who had every reason to hate him, to want him dead. Jackson was capable with a gun. Eli was an expert. Jackson could fight. Eli had been made for it. Jackson's heart kicked into high gear. Adrenaline shot through him. He had to be smarter, had to be faster. And when the time came, if it did, he needed to be ready. As if reading his thoughts, Eli smiled for the first time. It was a wolf's smile the smile of a predator on the hunt. Eli lowered the rifle. Then let's find her. 53. Shiloh Easton, Day 7. The cabin stood in the center of a small clearing. Tall trees rose around it, junk in the overgrown yard, weeds as high as her knees. She'd checked three other cabins on her route, before finding this one. The ramshackle building looked cheap, slapped together. The dusty windows stared at her like blank eyes. Faded green paint peeled from the front door. Three concrete blocks served as steps. The roof sagged, the shingles carpeted in moss. It was the rusty bird bath in front of the cabin that had drawn her attention, the same one from the picture. She'd forgotten it until now. This was it. This was the one. A sense of palpable wrongness sifted into her pores, her skin, her bones. Nausea slicked her insides. The closer she got to the cabin, the sicker she felt. Her gut nodded, her palms clammy. Her first instinct was to rush to the battered front door and use her lockpick to break in. The truth lay in wait for her inside those shabby walls. She knew it, felt it. Cody was in there. Shiloh dropped to her hands and knees. The crossbow slid off her shoulder, but she jerked it back and crept forward. Leaves in her face, twigs snagging her hair, 
her kneecaps muddy. A spider crawled over her right hand. The leaves of a fern tickled her cheek, a twig poked into her ear. She ignored it all, focused on the cabin, drawing closer through the tangle of underbrush. The grass driveway consisted of twin ruts to the right of the cabin. A lopsided shed stood behind the cabin, along with an outhouse. A pile of firewood next to it, a rusted wheelbarrow covered in leaves. Three rain barrels were stacked along the left side of the cabin. It didn't look derelict, but neither did it look lived in. It existed in an in-between state, like the witch's candy house in the Hansel and Gretel stories, or a secret abode in the stories of fairies and fae, demons and goblins, mysterious, compelling, dangerous. The air was still. Crickets and insects buzzed in the underbrush. No vehicle was parked out front. But maybe he parked somewhere else and hiked in. Didn't mean no one was there. Time passed. Seconds, minutes. Hunger rumbled in her belly. With one hand, she dug into her sweatshirt pocket and tugged out a Snickers bar. Tearing the wrapper open with her teeth, she took a few bites. Caramel and nuts sticking in her teeth, chocolate coating her tongue. It was her second candy bar of the afternoon. She was still hungry. Leaves rasped beneath her sleeve as she stuffed the trash in her pocket and returned her focus to the cabin. Impatience gnawed at her. The cabin was deserted. No one was here. It was silly to be afraid. Besides, who knew how much time she had before someone did come? She was wasting precious seconds, her chance to find Cody before it was too late. The cabin door swung open. Shiloh stilled. Every muscle went rigid. A man stepped onto the porch. He wore the same green sweater vest from earlier. His sleeves were rolled up. A pair of binoculars hung on a strap around his neck. He had a bland face and thinning blonde hair. Dizziness washed through her. She knew him. In the photo, he'd been much younger, with a beard. At night, it had been too dark. In town, he'd faced away from her, but now she knew exactly who he was. Walter Boone looked like he'd stepped from Munising Middle School onto a foreign planet. He looked so normal, so average. The indulgent uncle, the quiet next-door neighbor, the polite guy. You never gave a second glance. He didn't belong here. Nothing about this felt right. Instinctively. She lowered herself belly first to the ground and peered through the leaves. Her gaze lowered to his feet. Black leather, white stitching, red laces. Mud crusted the soles. It was him. No mistake. The man she was certain had taken Cody. Boone stepped down to the overgrown grass. Weeds scraped his shins as he moved across the clearing toward the rutted path that traced the right boundary of the property. A minute later, the distant sound of an engine roared to life. It rumbled for a few minutes, before fading into silence. Boone must have hidden his vehicle somewhere with another exit point. Shiloh waited five minutes. Answers were inside that cabin. Not just answers, but her flesh and blood brother, alive and breathing, eyes bright as he shot her his lopsided grin. What the hell took you so long? She could give up, turn back, get help. But how long would that take? Hours? Especially without phones, or a way to contact Eli. The miles-long hike to Eli's campsite from here, then the hike back here. Even if she trusted Jackson, she'd have to return to town and wait for Jackson to call in backup and roll in with the cavalry. Every second she wasted on indecision was a second less that she had to rescue Cody. Boone could come back and squirrel Cody away to a place she would never find. Or maybe he'd just kill him. Either way, she had to make her move. She thought of her mother. How a man like this had taken her life, had stolen her from Shiloh and Cody forever. This monster wouldn't do the same. He wouldn't get away with it. Adrenaline drove her more than her fear. 
As she straightened from her crouch, the crossbow shifted on her back. Standing, she felt exposed, vulnerable. The scent of pine and jasmine was strong in her nostrils. Leaves crunched beneath her feet as she crept from the concealment of the underbrush out into the open yard. Her eyes darted to and fro, mindful of a trap. A blue jay chattered angrily at her from a jack pine, as if she were invading its private space. She felt the invader in every fiber of her being. She reached the door and twisted the door handle, locked. Slipping her lockpick set from her pocket, she inserted the tension wrench into the bottom of the keyhole and applied a slight pressure, then inserted the rake pick at the top of the lock. It was an old lock, an old cabin. Her hands trembled. Sweat slid down her spine. She cursed under her breath and wiped her damp palms on her pant legs. She torqued the wrench as she scrubbed the pick back and forth, repeating the process until the pins were set. She could do this in her sleep, easy as stealing candy from a baby. She'd done that too, just to see if it was that easy. It wasn't. Babies cried. No babies crying now. Just her own fear thudding in her ears. Akron, Ohio. Lansing, Michigan. Indianapolis, Indiana. The familiar refrain calmed her, steadied her nerves. She clenched her jaw, listened for the faintest click of the spring. The lock opened. The door creaked open. Shiloh stepped into darkness. 54. Eli Pope. Day 7. We're here, Eli said in a low voice. Be quiet and do as I do. Jackson nodded. I'm serious. Out here, I'm in charge, not you. Irritation crossed Jackson's features, his mouth tight, eyes narrowed. An internal war waged in the shadows behind his eyes. Like any cop, he was used to giving the orders, civilians falling into line. Eli was no civilian, and out here he was the expert, not Jackson. Jackson's shoulders remained squared, but something softened in his stance, the skin around his eyes. He knew it was true. Fine. As much as Eli resented him, he respected Jackson's strength. It was no easy thing for a man to put his ego aside for the sake of the mission. His AK-47 in the ready position, Eli approached the cave from the east, not along the overgrown trail, the way Shiloh did. He'd told her he wouldn't follow her, but he'd lied. He made it his business to know the details, to know who visited him and where they came from. With Jackson trailing after him, Eli circled the perimeter twice, ears straining, senses on full alert, checking for signs that anyone had been here other than Shiloh. They moved slowly, quietly, each footstep placed with care. As they moved, Eli looked for broken twigs, torn leaves, footprints in the dirt, disruptions in the pattern of the fallen leaves and forest floor detritus. Every minute or so, he stopped, took a knee, and listened. He scanned not just the ground, but the dense woods around them, searching for shadows, for any strange movements. Twenty yards to the east, a startled doe exploded from the underbrush. Other than that, there was nothing. Once he'd ascertained that the area was clear, he approached the cave. He noted the trash bag that she'd tied up in a tree to keep the wild animals from reaching it. Inside the cave, her sleeping bag was made, but empty. He didn't smell any residual smoke. The coals at the bottom of her Dakota fire pit were cool to the touch. She'd been gone for a while. We missed her. Eli angled his chin at a glint of metal leaning against a nearby boulder. My bike is here. Means she left it. Wherever she went, she's on foot. You gave her your bike? She stole it. Jackson snorted. <laughs> no one steals from you. You see everything coming a mile away. Of course he'd known. And of course, he'd let her slip away. If she needed it, he was glad to give it. 
Guess I've lost my touch. Doubt it. I'll find her. Jackson fell silent, letting Eli do what he needed to do. He stood still and didn't get in the way. It was a rare skill. After scanning the trees again, Eli lowered his gaze to the ground and focused on the story the dirt, disturbed leaves, and matted grass told him. He detected the slight drag of her left foot. She still favored her injured ankle. Eli followed her trail in a southwesterly line from the cave across a patch of rock-strewn dirt into the woods. The forest was dense, with little underbrush. Leaves, pine needles, and fallen branches littered the ground. He found a broken spider's web, partially rebuilt. Someone or something had passed that way within the last few hours. Twenty yards later, the slight indentation of a partial footprint. Soon after that, the trail went cold. He retreated to the last sign he'd spotted, the broken spider web and half footprint. He made increasing circles in five-yard swaths, looking for some sign of her. There was nothing. He'd lost it. Thirty minutes later, he returned to the cave. I lost the trail. Frustration laced Eli's voice. I can keep looking, but we're losing light. We need Lena, Jackson said. Eli's chest tightened. What? Jackson eyed him. You don't know, do you? Eight years in prison keeps you out of the gossip loop. Jackson ignored the sarcasm. Lena does search and rescue with her Newfoundland bear. They're quite the team. She's good. If anyone can find Shiloh now, it's her. I thought she was in Tampa. She's not in Tampa. I asked her to come back before the grid went down. She got in last night. She spent the night at my parents' house, but she went home this morning. To the Easton place. Eli went rigid. Lena is here? Why? Because her father was murdered. Because her niece and nephew have disappeared. Because the UP is safer than most places she might run to. And she's smart enough to know she needed to run. To get out of the city before it implodes on itself. Eli said nothing. Emotions he'd thought long dead, warred within him. Guilt and longing, shame and desire. She didn't come back for you, Jackson said. Eli knew that. Lena must hate him like everyone else. Though she'd stood by him the longest, more than any sane person would have. In the end, she'd left him, like they all had, every last one of them just as he'd deserved. He said, then let's get Lena. 55. Shiloh Easton. Day 7. The cabin was heavy with shadows. Shiloh repressed a shudder and took a step inside, then another. The darkness pressed in with a physical weight. A chill touched the back of her neck as Shiloh conducted a quick search. The narrow living room on one end, the kitchen against the other, a tiny bedroom tacked onto the living room with a back door next to the rickety bed. The walls and floor were constructed of rough wood planks. The kitchen consisted of plywood countertops set over a couple of cabinets. A camp stove and tin wash basin sat in one corner with water jugs standing next to them. There was no bathroom, no electricity, no plumbing. The outhouse was in the backyard. A sickly green sofa sagged in the living room. A rickety end table and a glass-topped coffee table sat on a faded oriental rug. Black curtains covered the two windows, as if Boone wanted to keep out everything, even sunlight. A battery-operated LED lantern and a lamp with the base in the shape of a hawk stood on the end table. Puzzle pieces were laid out on the coffee table, the image about 75% finished. It was a picture of a bunch of glossy Petoskey stones, Michigan's state stone. Every minute or so, she paused to strain her ears, listening over the rush of her pulse. Nothing under the bed, or beneath the mattress, or in the nightstand or dresser, which were filled with items like cold medicine and chapstick, 
a couple of plaid shirts, and khaki pants folded neatly in a drawer. She needed some sign of Cody's presence. His drawing notebook, his backpack, a lock of blonde hair, his black hoodie, anything. There was nothing here. What if she was wrong? Had she made a terrible mistake? There was a wrongness about this place. So wrong, it penetrated deep into her bones. The white-stitched boots, the pictures beneath the bed. No, Boone was hiding something, somewhere. She just had to find it. Thump. Shiloh seized her crossbow and spun around. Shouldering it, she braced the stock against her cheek and sighted the windows, the front door, the sofa. Nothing. She moved swiftly to the closest window and nudged aside the curtain. Outside, nothing moved. She scanned the tall weeds, the rusty bird bath, the rain barrels, the trees. The sound had come from nearby. It had sounded so close, like it was inside the cabin itself. Thump. Shiloh stiffened. Adrenaline poured through her system, lit her nerves on fire. Turning slowly, she scanned the room. Thump. There was no one here. She'd seen Boone leave. She'd checked the bedroom. There was nowhere to hide. Thump. Her gaze lowered to the floor. The muffled sound came again. Something bumping against the underside of the floorboards? Something, or someone. Anxiety scrabbled over her skin, the desire to flee so powerful that her legs nearly buckled. Instead of running, she approached the center of the room. Thump. It was coming from right beneath the rug. Her heart hammered against her ribs as she set the crossbow on the floor beside her, using both hands to shove back the coffee table, careful not to disturb the puzzle. Then the end table. The lamp nearly toppled over. The base was heavy, made of iron. It wasn't even plugged in. Not that it mattered, with zero electricity out here, or anywhere. The Asian rug was threadbare. Shiloh rolled it out of the way, exposing rustic pine wood floors. Big, heavy iron nails. Nothing to explain the dull thumping. Her eyes snagged on a rectangular outline. Ridges in the floor where they shouldn't be. An iron handle. A trap door. Her heart caught in her throat. She stopped breathing. Here it was. Cody had to be behind that secret door. He had to be. She'd finally found him. Dropping to her hands and knees, she slid her fingers through the cumbersome iron hook and pulled it up. Teeth gritted, her muscles straining. She yanked with all her might. Come on, come on, come on. The trap door squeaked open on rusty hinges, revealing a rectangle of pitch blackness. Shiloh grabbed the LED lantern and peered into the depths. The fetid stink of urine and feces assaulted her senses. A glimpse of hard-packed dirt walls. Wood beams filmed with spider webs. A five-gallon bucket in one corner. A dirty mattress on the floor in the other. A pair of eyes gazed up at her. Horror seized Shiloh. With a gasp, she fell back. The white oval of a face. The red O of an open mouth. A girl. She wore a filthy tank top and shorts. Her pale body too skinny, ribs poking out, belly concave, dirt crusting her skin. A pair of dark eyes. Once shiny red hair tangled and matted. She gripped a knotted rope in both hands. Ruby, Shiloh whispered. Ruby, Carpenter. Don't leave me, Ruby rasped. Please don't leave me. She must have screamed herself hoarse. Screamed and screamed, and no one came. No one to hear her but the birds, squirrels, and foxes. They weren't telling. The wild things kept the forest's secrets. I've got you, 
Shiloh stretched out her hand but couldn't reach her. Their fingertips just brushed. There must be a ladder or something, but Shiloh hadn't found it. Get me out. Her eyes wide and frantic. More wild animal than human. Shiloh fought to control her own panic. Use the bucket to get higher and toss me the rope. The girl turned away from the square of the trap door above her and darted from Shiloh's view. A heartbeat later, she reappeared with the five-gallon bucket and dumped it out on the dirt floor. The rancid stench of piss, feces, and vomit rose up and struck Shiloh afresh. She gagged. Ruby flipped the bucket and stood on it, then tossed Shiloh the rope. Her teeth were smeared red, her lips bruised and cut. Raw, oozing wounds encircled each of her wrists. Rope burns, ropes that had shackled her hands, bound her helpless and trapped here. Shiloh let her outrage fuel her, make her stronger. Bracing her feet, butt against the floor, Shiloh lowered the rope into the pit. Take it and pull yourself up enough to reach the trap door. You can grab the handle here to pull yourself the rest of the way. I can't. Climb. If you want to live, you got to climb. Ruby's gaze cleared. Some deep down glimmer of willpower flickered to the surface. Who Ruby was, who she'd been before this, and who she would discover after. If she was strong enough, if she could survive this terrible moment, then she could survive the next. Shiloh had been doing it her entire life. Standing on the bucket, Ruby seized the rope. She was only a foot or so below the trap door. What would have been easy for Shiloh took monumental effort from Ruby, who was weak and dehydrated. With a groan, her muscles straining, Shiloh managed to pull her up enough to get her arms and torso above the hole. Shiloh dropped the rope, grabbed Ruby's skinny arms, and jerked her backward. Grunting, Shiloh dragged the girl to her feet. She stood, swaying unsteadily, blinking in shock, like she'd just landed on another planet. Shiloh looked again at her teeth. One was chipped, and fibers were stuck between her front teeth. Fibers from a rope. This girl had chewed through her own restraints. Then she'd tied a knot on one end of the length of rope and used it to smack the underside of the trap door again and again and again. For how long? Hours? Days? Had Boone heard her? Had he listened? Sitting on his moldy couch doing his damn puzzles, knowing she was the mouse? caught in his ultimate trap. Rage and fear pulsed through her, but the rage was stronger. People like Jackson promised to keep them safe. But how could he, with these monsters lurking in the dark, a windigo with a human face? Ruby's legs sagged, a stunned, slack expression on her face. Pity washed through Shiloh, but so did urgency. Ruby. Where is Cody? Shiloh seized her bony shoulders and shook her. She quivered like a rag doll. Where is my brother? Cody Easton, five nine, blonde hair. He's supposed to be here. He has to be here. Recognition flickered in Ruby's eyes. She shook her head dully. No, no one else. Just me. Think! Did you hear anything? See any sign of him? A second voice, footsteps up there. A notebook filled with really good drawings of ducks and fish and stupid stuff like that. Ruby kept shaking her head, her eyes rolling loose in their sockets like marbles. Ruby didn't know anything. She needed a hospital. She needed adults to help her. Despair threatened to choke Shiloh. If Cody wasn't here... If he'd never been here? There had to be a clue, an answer, somewhere. It had to be here. This made no sense. It wasn't right. Couldn't be right. She could feel it. Could feel her brother, like he was hiding in the walls, trapped between the studs and the drywall, duct tape over his mouth, but he was calling to her, trying desperately to reach her. 
She couldn't hear him. She couldn't hear anything. Pure instinct made her look up. It was like static electricity, a cobweb brushing against her cheek, a ghost breathing down the back of her neck. Shiloh seized Ruby by her skinny upper arm and steered her to the bedroom and the back door. Go! Ruby gave her a look of pure terror. Don't leave me! Shiloh understood then how foolish she'd been, how dangerous a game she'd played by coming here. She could not fight the Windigo alone. She needed help, she needed Eli, and she needed Jackson. I'm coming. But if we get separated, if something happens, you need to know where to go. There's a deer trail between the shed and the stack of firewood. Follow it half a mile east to the creek. There's an ATV trail that will take you to Snow Road. They both heard the engine at the same time. Ruby's eyes went round with terror. Fear stuck in Shiloh's throat like a hook. She made the decision in a heartbeat. If they both ran, Boone would hunt them down. But if she managed to wound or kill the monster, Ruby would have a chance. She hadn't saved her brother yet, but she could do this. Shiloh pushed Ruby out the back door. Go, she whispered. Run. I'm too scared. I can't. Shiloh looked her hard in the eyes. You chewed through your own ropes, bitch. You don't need me. Go get help. Go. Ruby turned and staggered down the uneven back steps. From the doorway, Shiloh watched her run to the tree line, red hair aflame behind her. Footsteps outside, coming from the front of the cabin. He was here. 56. Lena Easton. Day seven. It was dusk by the time Lena arrived at the cave. With communication down, Jackson had been forced to hike back out and drive to her father's house to collect her. She'd been unpacking, but dropped everything and left with him, grabbing the SAR backpack at the door that held everything she needed. Bear spread himself out along the length of the back seat, panting with excitement. There was work to be done, and he was eager and up to the task. The truck raced through town. In the passenger seat, Lena checked her pump. Her numbers were high, so she hurriedly bolused herself. Minutes later, they jostled along the logging road. As he drove, Jackson filled her in. She felt it radiating from him, his fear, dread, and desperation. His fear became her own. Shiloh out there, alone, a monster likely hunting her. They had to find her first. Lena and Jackson made the hike in tense silence. At the cave, Eli was waiting. He paced like a panther at the cave's entrance. He wore a camouflage jacket, covered in leaves and twigs, a rifle slung over his shoulder, pistol in one hand, his other hand a clenched fist at his side. As Lena and Jackson approached, Bear trotting at her side, he turned to face her. Those coal black eyes, slanting cheekbones, the firm line of his mouth. Lena, he said. Time stopped. Her heart stopped with it. An electric charge passed between them. It felt like being struck by lightning. The years didn't matter. She was twelve again, then sixteen, then twenty-five. A girl in love with a boy with too much darkness in his heart to love her back. She'd known it and loved him anyway. Eli, she said in a strangled voice. She felt a million things when she looked at him. A thousand memories, a hundred things to say. But the words were locked down deep. Yet, whatever lay between them, now was not the time. Sorry to interrupt the reunion, but we have work to do, Jackson said. Lena, what do you need? Tell us how to help you. Lena cleared her throat and focused on the task at hand. Is this the PLS, the point last seen? For Bear to find her scent, we need a starting place. This is it, Eli said. 
she withdrew a paper bag from her pack and handed it to Eli. I need an item of Shiloh's, preferably something she's worn recently. Use the bag to handle it. Try not to contaminate it with your scent. Without a word, Eli strode into the cave and returned with a heather gray t-shirt emblazoned with Yoda on the front. Do or do not, scrawled in yellow print. She wore this yesterday. Jackson turned to Eli. Indecision twisted his features. I need your help out there. God help me, but I do. I know your skills, your training. I killed people for a living, Eli said in a low voice. I will not hesitate to kill more. You're out here with an untrained civilian and a dog, and no backup, no partner, no SWAT team, no one to have your back. I'm quite aware. Jackson didn't break eye contact. Are you going to have my back, Eli? Or are you going to shoot me in the back the first chance you get? Lena didn't breathe, didn't move, neither did Bear. He stood stock still, watching the two men facing off, his hackles raised. You'll have to trust me. Eli's lip curled in derision. Like I once trusted you. That's not an answer. I need to know, Eli. Jackson's jaw bulged. He looked uncertain, but resolute, determined to do whatever it took to find Shiloh. This is bigger than you and me. I need to know you understand that. I do. Eli leaned in. Make no mistake. I will do what needs to be done. Hate me all you want, but you do need me. Jackson blew out a breath. He took a controlled step backward and relaxed his fists. He shifted his gaze to Lena. Pain in his face, doubt, and fear. Eli is right. It's dangerous. I know the risks. We should have backup. A SWAT team, a swarm of deputies combing the forest. With the rioting in Detroit and in the Sioux, I don't know how long it will take for anyone to arrive, if they even will. They have bigger fish to fry. Lena raised her chin. You aren't responsible for me. I'm responsible for me. This is my job. This is what I do. Jackson looked at her, searching her face. And she knew he saw the fear there. She didn't even attempt to hide it. She was terrified, not for herself, but her niece. Out there, alone somewhere. Or worse, with a monster who wanted to hurt her. For so long, Lena had let fear dictate her future. Fear had made her obey her father, had made her flee the UP, leaving her loved ones behind. Fear had made her abandon Shiloh and Cody. She wouldn't let that fear best her now. Lena, Jackson said again, this perp is a predator backed into a corner. Like any wild animal, he's going to fight back because he has no other choice. He knows we're on to him. Eli watched her, those black eyes betraying nothing. That's why I'm here. Any threat out there will have to go through me first. Lena met his gaze. Her stomach nodded. She knew he had been with the 75th Regiment, a skilled Tier 1 operator. Even now, she trusted Eli. Never, not once, had she ever feared him. She hadn't doubted him back then, not for a second. She'd doubted herself. And when she'd failed to save him, after failing to save her sister, it had been too much to bear. That stain marked her still. Lena patted the M&P pistol tucked against her hip. It was loaded with a round chambered. I'm prepared. Eli gave her a nod of approval. How can we help? Jackson asked. Tell us what to do. Do you have a topographical map? Jackson pulled one out of his windbreaker pocket and handed it to her. Here you go. Bear and I have one purpose out here. Find the missing, and as quickly as possible. I'm following Bear, but I'm also handling him. When I'm out on a search, I'm a detective, a tracker, a psychologist. 
And when I find our missing person, then I'm also a paramedic, a priest, a best friend, and consoler. We'll be right behind you, Eli said. Lena signaled to Bear, who'd been nosing Shiloh's sleeping bag inside the mouth of the cave. He trotted over at his handler's command, instantly alert. They had work to do. Find what was lost. Bring the girl home. 57. Shiloh Easton. Day 7. The doorknob turned. Alarm clawed at Shiloh. No time to think or plan. Nowhere to hide. Her heart threatened to pound out of her chest. The front door swung open. The creak of a footstep. She had a second, maybe two. As soon as he saw the disordered living room, he'd know. Shiloh took three quick steps and exited the bedroom. She darted into the living room, crossbow against her shoulder, stock against her cheek, finger on the trigger. Trembling, she planted her feet, disengaging the safety as she brought the bow to her line of sight. Walter Boone stepped inside and closed the door behind him. He looked up and froze. Time slowed. She sighted his chest through her reticle. A startled look crossed his face, and then he gave her a friendly smile. He was an ordinary man, a harmless man, somebody's uncle. For half a second, it threw her off, which was exactly what he wanted. He lunged at her. She squeezed the trigger. Panic made her fumble, the crossbow shifting as the bolt released. Instead of striking his chest, the bolt drilled into Boone's right bicep. With a howl, he staggered back. It wasn't enough. Her fingers trembled as she reached for a second bolt, backed up against the bookcase. Nowhere to run. He came at her again. She grasped the bolt, lifted the crossbow. He reached her first. With his uninjured hand, he seized her by the face. His fingers splayed across her cheeks, gripping her chin, nails digging into her jaw. He slammed her head against the wall. Darkness exploded across her vision, bright stars of vertigo. Nausea churned in her stomach, she nearly vomited. Dazed, her body refused to obey her, her muscles weak and jerky. He ripped the crossbow from her fingers and threw it across the floor. Then he seized her by the hair and threw her to the floor. She attempted to punch him, scratch or hit anything. Nothing happened. She tried to clamber to her hands and knees. He kicked her twice in the stomach. Pain exploded through her body. She curled into herself, hands over her head, screaming insults through stinging tears. He stood over her, breathing hard. The bolt had punctured his right arm through his bicep. Blood dripped down his arm. This man was no kindly uncle or polite neighbor. He wore a mask, and underneath was the heart of a killer. I've been waiting to meet you. I think you know that. I thought you'd slipped through my fingers. And then what do you do? You show up at my doorstep, in my secret place, my sacred place. Her brain wasn't working correctly. His form swam in and out of focus. Everything went dark and pulsing. Time went away for a while. When she blinked back into consciousness, he held a rope in his good hand. He rolled her onto her belly. Her chin bumped the floor. Growling with pain, he forced her arms behind her back and twisted the rope around her wrists. The nubby fibers scratched her skin. She tried to fight, to resist. Her bones vibrated beneath her skin. Her heart shuddered inside her chest. Footsteps clattered. He moved away. The bedroom door swung open and he disappeared inside. Swearing, feet shuffling. A cabinet door opened and closed. She tried to open her eyes and keep them open. It didn't work. Tried to get her legs to move, to get her the hell out of here. 
Nothing worked. He returned to the living room. There was a scraping sound, the creak of the trap door opening. Boone cursed. You let her out. She's long gone, Shiloh spat through bloody teeth. She's getting help. He gave her a long, steady stare, as if considering her words. I don't think so. There are miles of wilderness in every direction. Someone like you can find your way around the woods, but not that one. She won't last a mile. I'll find her. Screw you! Let me go or I'll kill you. I'll cut off your balls and tie them around your neck. Don't think I won't. Boone squatted beside her, a pained smile on his lips. He knew, and he knew that she knew. He was the cat and she was the mouse, and he had her. She froze, terror coursing through her veins. He leaned forward, and with his good hand, he pushed a strand of hair back from her face. He stroked her cheek. She turned her face toward him and tried to bite his fingers, but he was too quick. He jerked his hand back out of reach. It's time we talked, you and I. The cadence of his voice, that bland smile, those eyes that didn't leave hers. Her gaze dropped to the boots. Black leather, white stitching, red laces. And she remembered. 58. Lena Easton. Day 7. At the foot of the cave entrance, Lena whistled to Bear. He stood in front of her, tail wagging, ears perked, alert and ready to work. Adrenaline shot through her veins. The stakes were high and climbing with every passing second. Lena opened the paper bag that contained Shiloh's t-shirt and offered it to Bear. This is Shiloh. We need to find Shiloh. She's a very special girl. I need you to find her, boy. Find Shiloh. Bear gave the shirt several enthusiastic sniffs. He looked at Lena his huge torso quivering with pent-up energy and excitement. The Newfoundland was strong, smart, and tireless. He would search for hours in any conditions, sun or rain, storm or blizzard, over any terrain. Anything that Lena asked of him, Bear would do. Lena signaled with her hand. Find Shiloh. Bear lifted his snout in the air. For a minute he scented and circled, and then he stiffened. Hackles up, tail stiff straight out behind him. He'd alerted on Shiloh's scent. Together they moved into the woods. Eli and Jackson trotted ten yards behind them, both men armed to the teeth. Eli took one side, Jackson the other. They constantly scanned their surroundings, checking for threats. Red-bathed moonlight filtered through the canopy above her head. She couldn't see the aurora through the leaves. A crimson cast transformed the world, everything glimmering. Within several hundred yards, they broke from the dense trees onto a narrow trail which Bear followed. Hopefully, Shiloh would stay on the trail. Tracking someone cross-country at night would be a challenge, even with the aurora. Bear bounded ahead of her. Every couple of minutes, the dog glanced backward, as if checking on her, making sure she was following, letting her know that he was still hard at work. The scent was easy to lose. Depending on conditions and the terrain, wind and air currents constantly shifted. The scent could loop or pool. Too much wind or humidity altered air current patterns. A stream or drainage ditch could funnel scents. On a hot day with no air movement, the scent wouldn't disperse, limiting its range. But Bear was good at what he did. She had absolute faith in him. As they moved deeper into the woods, she made notes of landmarks as they passed and checked her compass to keep their bearings. It was her job to search for physical signs, tracks, footprints, broken twigs and bushes, candy wrappers, abandoned articles of clothing, anything relevant. Twenty minutes later, Bear alerted. His body went stiff, ruffle raised along the back of his neck. He sniffed at the base of a stump. 
Small twigs were broken off at the stems, as if a girl had sat on the log to take a breather or drink some water. Good boy. Good job, bear. Lena flagged the alert with a piece of blue tape she kept in her backpack. She paused to log in the location, the time, and the status on the notes app on her phone, which was freshly charged from her solar charger. The charge should last all night. After checking her pump, her numbers were good. They kept going. Minutes later, Bear alerted again, this time on a footprint in a soft patch of dirt. Lena flagged the alerts with blue tape and used orange tape to mark their progress. Normally, she'd call in their status and location to base. She would coordinate and receive updates from the other searchers. This time, there was no base, no coordinators, no team, just them. Eli and Jackson were behind her. They stayed close, moving quiet as ghosts. Bear moved briskly. He checked behind to make sure Lena was within sight. He scented the air, turned in a tight circle, tail stiff. After a moment of hesitation, he kept moving in a general southeastern direction, following the trail away from the coast, deeper into the Hiawatha National Forest. An hour passed. She paused for a snack and water for herself and Bear, then checked the compass and noted their location on the topographical map. In the dark, it was easy to lose yourself. The wilderness had never felt so foreign, so hostile. The dense woods bristled with malice. Shadows stretched and quivered like beasts crouching behind boulders and trees, prowling the rocky outcroppings, the ravines and caves. She felt eyes on her, glowing pears peering from the darkness, waiting, watching. Ahead of her, Bear alerted again. He stood quivering, hackles up and tail stiff, sniffing at a shadowy patch beneath a cluster of rhododendron bushes. She shone her flashlight across the ground. Something silvery and metallic glinted in the leaves. A candy bar wrapper. It looked fresh. She caught a whiff of chocolate and caramel. After she tagged the evidence, she looked back at Eli and Jackson, who'd stopped a few yards away. I have a Snickers wrapper here. It looks fresh. Any chance it could be our girls? That's her, Eli said. She's out here. Bolstered by the find, they kept moving. Anxiety and fear tangled in her stomach. With every step, Lena had the disconcerting feeling that she was heading closer and closer to her fate. Her destiny lay at the end of this dark and twisting trail. Whether it would be salvation or destruction, she did not yet know. 59. Shiloh Easton. Day 7. Time folded in on itself. Shiloh was back in the salvage yard, huddled in that crushed car. Gummy glass shards stuck to her hair, her heart a jackhammer in her chest. Peering through the jagged frame of the window, just enough space to see without being seen. He's coming! Shiloh, hide! Cody had turned to her with a blind panic so terrifying that she had obeyed without question. What's going on? Her grandfather demanded. I saw something, Cody gasped. I should have said something, but I didn't think he could find me. I didn't know he saw me. Go to the house, Amos said. Call the police. But go. Cody didn't have time to run. Boone approached. He looked benign, like every boring adult that Shiloh had ever met. Khaki pants, plaid shirt rolled up to the elbows, the top button undone. He could have come straight from school, except for his footwear. The black boots with the red laces, the white stitching. Mud crusted the soles like he'd been hiking. Amos, Boone said, panting out of breath from exertion. Sweat stains marred his pits. His dishwater blonde hair, normally combed so neatly, was windblown. What the hell are you doing on my property? Her grandfather said. 
Boone's gaze remained on Amos, though Cody stood frozen ten feet away. I was just out hiking the bluffs. Took a wrong turn coming back. No harm done. Boone took a handkerchief from his pocket and mopped his brow. They say we're gonna get quite the light show tonight. His wide, bright smile sent a shiver down Shiloh's spine. She didn't understand what she was seeing, why he was here. They stood 15 feet apart in a ragged triangle, surrounded by the husks of dozens of vehicles. Tension thrummed in the air. Cody shivered like a leaf caught in a windstorm, his face bone white, blue eyes wide and bloodshot. She'd never seen him so scared. Stay away from me. Boone raised his brows. Cody, what's wrong? His voice was cordial, concerned. Don't speak to him. Her grandfather stood next to the Volkswagen he'd been working on, engine parts splayed everywhere. His hand closed on the handle of a wrench. Get the hell off my property before I make you. Boone looked hurt and surprised. He took a step toward them, one hand behind his back. A rusted pickup sat behind him, the hood up, more tools scattered everywhere. Amos, we've always been amicable, haven't we? We can talk this out. I got nothing to say to you, and neither does he. Leave, or you will regret it. No need to call the police. Amos shifted, revealing the two-foot wrench in his hands. Who said anything about calling the police? A flicker passed behind Boone's eyes, a shadow on dark water. He seemed to be deciding something, weighing his odds, considering his options. He's, he's a killer, Cody stuttered. I saw you. I saw what you did. The smile dropped from his face like a sticker. Boone seized a tire iron and ran at Cody. Abject terror shot through Shiloh. Her mouth opened in a scream of warning, but no sound came out. She was invisible, unheard. Her grandfather moved. He lunged into the space between Cody and Boone and raised the wrench. He had once been a big, strong man but age had robbed him of his vitality. Boone was younger, faster. He raised the tire iron and brought it down on her grandfather's temple. Her grandfather crumpled before he could swing the wrench. Boone knocked it from his grasp and hit him again. Her grandfather toppled backward, making a sound like a wounded animal. Shiloh crouched, frozen, too terrified to move. The air smelled of oil and gasoline. No! Cody screamed. Boone raised the crowbar again, brought it down again, then again. It happened so fast, it was over in a matter of seconds. Blackness fringed her vision. A rushing roar filled her ears. States and capitals tumbled through her head, disjointed and terrible. Then she was falling flailing, toppling into darkness. Boone pushed himself off the still form of her grandfather. He wasn't moving. One foot twitched. The tire iron in Boone's right hand was coated in red. A fine spray of red spattered his boots. He dropped the tire iron and turned toward Cody. Shaken from his stupor, Cody ran. Shiloh faded the darkness sucking her away as Walter Boone sprinted into the woods in pursuit of her brother. 60. Shiloh Easton, Day 7. Shiloh blinked. The cabin snapped back into focus. The stench of vomit and piss filled her nostrils. Reality rushed in with dizzying waves. Boone knelt beside her, a gun in one hand. Blood seeped through the gauze he'd wrapped around his bicep. He'd managed to remove the bolt. Grief 
threatened to swallow her. Sorrow choked her throat. The man she'd feared and resented her whole life had stepped in front of his grandson and taken the blow. He'd used his body to block Boone's view of the wrecked Altima, of Shiloh. If only Cody had told the truth as soon as he'd come home that night. If only he'd been raised in a household where truth-telling was a safe thing, where every word or action wasn't rife with danger. But they hadn't lived in a house like that. They'd lived with hostile silence and bouts of pent-up violence hanging over the dinner table like an explosive storm cloud. They'd lived with a man who grieved into a bottle, haunted by the ghost of his murdered daughter, who couldn't bear his own guilt, let alone the burden of two grandchildren who'd needed him, depended on him, who'd reminded him of what he'd lost. He must have loved them, somewhere down deep, for him to do what he did, for him to have tried to save them in the end. Another memory filtered through her panicked haze, she had regained consciousness at some point, the blackness receding enough to stumble from the crushed car. She remembered kneeling over the body, hands on her grandfather's chest, weeping, screaming, and then nothing again, a blankness that descended over everything. Shiloh raised her bloody chin. You killed my grandfather. Only because I had to, Boone said. I'm not a murderer, Shiloh. That's what you have to understand about this whole situation. I'm not who you think I am. She blinked, forcing her gaze to clear. She would mourn later, once she got the hell out of here. Now she had to focus, to be smart, to figure out a way to escape. Where is he? Where's my brother? Contrition flashed in his eyes. The lake took him. That's not true. He's alive. He's here. You're hiding him. You're lying. I'm not, Shiloh. I'm not lying. You take girls. I've seen the pictures. I know what you do. He clasped his hands together like he was imploring her to understand. I don't kill them. I love them. I take care of them. She squirmed, straining against her bonds. The planks dug into her spine. The ropes burned her wrists. You took Ruby. He bared his teeth. She presented herself like a gift. Normally, I only hunt further from home. There's some quote about not hunting in your own backyard. She stared at him blankly. She was just a runaway. A druggie, a slut, working one shelter to the next from Marquette to the Sioux to finance her meth fix. Everyone knew what she was. No one would look for her. No one but someone like Jackson Cross, and even he was too distracted to care. She wasn't yours to take. Neither was Cody. His smile widened. He looked like the cat who'd eaten the canary. You have no idea. I've taken lots of girls. The discarded ones. The trash that no one wants. There are a dime a dozen up here. Where is my brother? He frowned then, abruptly turning morose. I didn't want to. He left me no choice. After what happened with your grandfather, he took off running. Back into the woods. I had to go after him. Shiloh saw it then. Cody's panicked eyes, the terrible realization dawning on his face that it was too late for him, that he would not win this fight, that if he tried, Boone would catch sight of Shiloh, and then they'd both be dead. He hadn't abandoned her. He'd drawn the predator away. I didn't want to do it, he repeated. He made me do it. No, she whispered. It wasn't true. It couldn't be true. He went straight to the cliffs, fleet as a deer. It wasn't my fault. Cody did it. He just went over the edge, 
One second, outlined against the blue sky, the next, gone. He jumped, ran full tilt, and never even hesitated. You're wrong. You lie. A part of her wanted to close her eyes, to block it out, to return to the safety of her blank memories. But she couldn't. She had to hear it. Boone kept talking. He wouldn't stop. With every word, she felt herself falling. He landed on the rocks. The lake took his body. She felt herself draining somehow, her insides draining out of her onto the floor. All this time she'd been desperately searching. She had believed that if she were strong enough, brave enough, that she would be rewarded, that she would find him in the end. Everything she had done, risked, sacrificed, it had not been enough. That first day, when she woke with her grandfather's blood on her hands, her brother had already been lost, lost to the lake, to the waves, lost with no way to be found. Boone shook his head, as if baffled. I don't know why he would do that. But Shiloh knew. With a terrible clarity, she knew. Cody had grown up with the memory of violence deep in his bones. Her brother had always chosen his own path. He'd chosen to jump over torture and death at the hands of a monster in a sweater vest. Why? she whispered. Why, Cody? He leaned forward, his gun hand resting on one knee. His expression was intent, like he wanted her to understand like he was confessing at church. But there was no remorse in his eyes, none at all. Things went wrong. She wasn't supposed to die, the other girl. It just happened. An accident. He wasn't here to help me, like usual. I had to do it on my own. I tried something new, that's all. Something different. I wanted to know what it was like. They say the lake never gives up her dead. I took her out there, wrapped up in a tarp with chains so she'd sink and stay down there. It was a quiet night, still cold so no one was out. Should have been simple, should have been easy. I didn't see him in that damn boat with no lights. He saw me, though. I wouldn't have known. But he dropped something in the water. Maybe he shifted and bumped one of his paddles. Once I heard the noise, I knew he was out there. I knew I had to shut him up. He was a witness. I didn't know how much he knew or if he recognized me. I had no idea what he'd seen. But I had to take care of it. I chased him back to shore. Turned my lights on him, but I couldn't make out any details. Just a black hoodie and blonde hair. Scared eyes. He beached his little fishing boat and took off running. The little Neptune. I didn't know it was him, but I knew the boat. Who it belonged to. All I had to do was ask one of Sawyer's men. They were glad to help, to give me his name. And of course I knew who Cody Easton was. I taught him after school. She remembered it then, how Cody had acted strange that day. He'd been terrified, confused, not sure where to turn, afraid to tell their grandfather, terrified to go to the cops. They had been raised believing that adults were dangerous, not to be trusted. Even your own flesh and blood would turn on you. Boone scratched his head with the butt of the gun. I didn't want to. I had no choice. He left me no choice. Your grandfather, he got in the way. And then you. I didn't know you were there until the police put out the bolo for you. Even then, I wasn't sure. Until you broke into my cousin's trailer. He shrugged. I thought it was over. I really did. Turns out this solar flare thing was a gift. The police and sheriff's department caught up in maintaining order. She forced herself to think, to push away the grief, the terror, and desperation. Until me. He tilted his head, his expression impassive. He gazed down at her like she was some bizarre creature he'd never seen before. You went through my things. 
you stole from me. Maybe you aren't as smart as you think you are. His eyes narrowed to slits. I should have ended this that night. And I would have, if those tourists hadn't shown up. You were damn lucky. I thought you'd go to the police, I really did. Truthfully, I hoped you'd crawled into a hole somewhere and died. When the police didn't come for Fitch, I thought maybe you had. It's a shame. The cops have him now. I'll have to figure something else out. It probably means I have to leave this place. Start somewhere else fresh. But I've got a plan for that, too. You, though. This is the end of the road for you. He glanced up at the windows, then rocked back on his heels. I've wasted enough time. I'm going to deal with you, then I'm going after Ruby. You said you don't like killing, that you aren't a murderer. He shook his head, gave her a sad smile. It wasn't reflected in his eyes. He'll do it for me. All I have to do is throw you in that hole and wait. He'll come. Shiloh didn't know who he was talking about, but she had zero desire to meet him. She jerked on the ropes. Her wrists were rubbed raw. Let me go. People are coming for me. Jackson is coming. No one knows you're here. No one will ever know you were here. You'll disappear, just like your brother, like all the other lost girls. He hesitated and touched his bandaged arm. He grimaced from the pain. It's easier than most people think, killing someone. It's this big taboo, and then you do it, and you realize you had it in you the whole time. We all have killers inside us, waiting to come out. She bared her teeth at him. Untie me, and I'll kill you, no problem. I'll pull your brains out through your nose. He barked out a laugh. <laughs> You're his type. Mine too. A little young, but what do they say? Beggars can't be choosers. He stared at her. Something dark and ugly shone in his gaze. His eyes crinkled as he leaned in. On second thought, maybe I will do it myself. 61. Lena Easton, day seven. Bear lost the scent. They'd left the trail several minutes ago and moved through the trees, then entered a small clearing at the edge of a ravine. A ragged oval of sky opened overhead. The blood-red sky shone above them. The aurora was weakening. Threads of green and lavender wove through the undulating ribbons of crimson. Bear began to circle, snout in the air. Maybe he'd lost the scent, or picked up a cross scent, and was trying to get a new gauge on it, to figure it out. Lena watched Bear's tail, his hackles. Every reaction meant something. Minutes passed. He kept circling, trotting here and there, trying to find it. Trepidation snarled in her gut. If they didn't find the scent, there was no time to head back to base and pick it up tomorrow. They found Shiloh tonight. Or they didn't find her at all. Or they found her, but not alive. The memory of the old man she'd lost a week ago flashed through her mind. That was not an acceptable option. She couldn't allow it to happen. Kneeling, she rubbed the soft ruff of Bear's neck. Tears sparked the backs of her eyelids. This one's different. You feel that, right? I left her once when she was little. I was scared, and selfish, and brokenhearted. And I left two little kids behind, who needed me. I've spent the last eight years trying to make it up to everyone but them. She shook her head. Stupid, huh? Bear sensed her apprehension and whined in her ear, his doggy breath warm on her face. Pure devotion, pure love, no judgment. He offered comfort as only a dog like Bear could. We have to do this, okay? She pulled the dog's head close to hers and tilted her forehead so they were eye to eye. She stared into the chocolate brown eyes of her most faithful friend. You and me, 
We can do this. Tell me we can do this. Bear pushed his big head against Lena's. The human knelt on the leaf-strewn ground, drained and spent, scared, but resolved. The dog, patient and loyal, tail-thumping, tired, but willing to push past every endurance for his mistress. Bear gave a soft woof of encouragement. That's my boy. Jackson and Eli broke into the clearing behind her. Eli wore his ghillie suit. He held the AK-47 in the low ready position. Jackson gripped his shotgun. They looked like they were ready to go to war. What's wrong? Jackson asked. We lost the scent, but we can find it again. Lena sucked in a breath and steeled herself. Her energy flagging, she checked her pump. Her numbers were low and falling. She ate two packages of fruit snacks and gulped down apple juice. She shared some water with Jackson and Eli, then pulled out Bear's water bowl, poured him water, and gave him kibble from a Ziploc bag. Bear worked hard. He needed a rest, too. Even though everything in Lena pushed her to keep moving, to press on. Drink up, boy. Otherwise, they'll be sending a search party out for us. The irony wasn't lost on Lena. In this moment, they were the only search party. Everything had seemed to fall apart slowly, and then all at once. Once more, Lena shrugged off her backpack and removed the brown paper bag. She opened it and pulled out Shiloh's shirt. Refresh, reward, reestablish. This is Shiloh. We're going to find Shiloh. Bear's tail wagged so hard it shook his hindquarters. He barked and dashed for the edge of the clearing. She followed Bear down a ravine and up the other side, her thighs burning. Did he find it? Eli asked. Her heart surged. He found it. Don't get too far ahead, Jackson said. Wait for us. Lena was already scrambling after the dog. Good job, keep going. Bear moved swiftly, with purpose. The scent grew stronger. He was zeroing in, getting close. The cross currents in the ravine must have snarled up the scent cone. Lena broke into a jog, Jackson and Eli right behind her. The world was all shadows, tree trunks and ragged branches, felled logs and rocky ledges. Shadows pooled, receding, forming shapes of demons and wraiths. She pushed through the shadows, then broke out of the underbrush. There, in the scarlet moonlight, not marked on any map, not registered with official documentation or county permits, stood a cabin. 62. Eli Pope. Day 8. He's in there, Jackson said to Eli. And Shiloh's in there with him. We need to go in now. Eli shook his head, never taking his eyes off the cabin with his night vision field glasses. We don't have enough intel. We could be walking into a death trap. They lay, belly down, in a nest of pine needles, just inside the perimeter of the tree line, thirty yards from the front of the cabin. A fallen log offered cover and concealment. His ghillie suit provided additional camouflage, blurring his human form to anyone watching. They spoke in low whispers, maintaining as much noise and light discipline as possible. Eli would rather they didn't speak at all, but they had not trained together. They needed to communicate to execute this mission, however ad hoc it would be. They had sent Lena and Bear hiking back toward the closest main road, County Road 587, based on the map. Lena had her compass and heavy hiking boots. She would flag down a car and head to the sheriff's office back in Munising. Neither of them wanted Lena anywhere near the impending firestorm. He pushed thoughts of her out of his head. He needed total focus. Eli glanced at his watch. It was midnight. Staying low, he had circled the perimeter twice, examining the shed, the outhouse, gleaning what intel he could. He'd searched for IED booby traps, scanned for tripwires, anything out of place. He hadn't seen anything. 
It didn't mean the door wasn't bootstrapped with explosives to kill an entry team. It was impossible to discern what was inside. Tension wound tight in his gut. How close was the target to his weapon? Where was the hostage? How was she restrained? Was there more than one hostile? He needed answers to every question, but he wasn't going to get them. He was used to coordinated hostage rescues with the rangers and other government agencies. They had massive resources and intel at their disposal, including drones, tactical thermal imaging cameras, and listening devices. Eli and Jackson had none of those things. What toys do we have? Eli asked. I have breaching rounds in my shotgun, several flashbangs, a thermal imaging scope, but it won't help us see inside. Jackson reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out two sets of sound protection earplugs, handing one set to Eli. They would protect the ears from gunshots, but allowed for conversation. If they waited for the sheriff's department, or the state police to arrive, or the FBI SWAT team from the Detroit field office, Shiloh may not make it that long. Moments ago, Jackson had deputized him within his powers as undersheriff. Now he eyed Eli's AK-47. He exhaled. I don't know if this is the right thing. I am the monster you send in to take out a worse monster. Jackson nodded, unconvinced. He rubbed his jaw, nervous, on edge. Good. He should be. This was a cluster of epic proportions. Eli had already gone through his gear methodically, checking weapons, counting ammo, extra magazines, mentally preparing for the assault to come. It didn't matter how many times you ran through the drills, how many times you'd done this, in training or in real life, with bullets flying and enemies closing in. It could all go sideways in a heartbeat. He'd lost too many good team members, too many brothers and sisters in combat, had seen bad luck put a bullet in a man's brain a hundred times. I am going to arrest him, Jackson said. I am going to bring him in, and he's going to stand trial for what he's done. You're out of your mind. Do not use lethal force unless you have to. I have to. He will answer to the law, not to a vigilante with a gun. Then I won't use a gun. The law matters, Eli. The law is broken. Jackson sucked in a sharp breath. We save Shiloh. What you do after that is your choice, but the consequences will be yours too. Eli didn't take his eyes off the cabin. The curtains were closed. Nothing moved. The forest seemed to hold its breath. Understood. Maybe Eli should have eliminated Jackson back there in the woods, shot him in the spine, and left him to bleed out. He'd been sorely tempted. The truth was they needed each other. A partner could mean the difference between an operation's success or failure. Eli would rather have a spec ops hostage rescue team at his back but beggars couldn't be choosers. The curtains in the left window moved slightly, a flutter as a figure moved past it. The curtains were too opaque to make out details. Someone was in there with Shiloh. Were there two hostels inside? Three? Or just the one? You see that? Jackson asked. I do. We need to go in now. He could be hurting her, killing her. Jackson's mouth thinned, like he couldn't bear to imagine what that monster might be doing to Shiloh. Neither could Eli. But he couldn't let hotheads compromise the mission either. This will be a crapshoot. You might get him and save her, or he might shoot her, shoot one or both of us. Without intel, flip a coin. He dies. Flip it again. We die. One more time. She dies. In a go-now situation, with so little intel, the possibility of losing part of the team, or the hostage herself, was high. Even using flashbangs could injure Shiloh, 
depending on where she was inside the cabin. Permanent blindness, deafness, or serious burns were possible. He didn't like the odds. I don't care what happens to me, Eli said. She does not die. That is not how this is going to end. Jackson glanced at him. We're on the same page there. The unspoken agreement passed between them. Whatever reckoning was between them, it came after they saved the girl. Eli's radio crackled. This is Lena, come in. He kept the binoculars zeroed in on the cabin as he brought the radio to his mouth. You're a go, Lena. There's someone out here. Don't engage, Jackson said. Lena, don't you do it. Too late, Lena said. It's, it's not a threat. Call you in a minute. Lena. The radio clicked off. 63. Lena Easton. Day 8. Less than a mile from the cabin, a figure crashed through the underbrush off to the southwest, maybe fifty yards up the ridgeline of a ravine. Through the trees, Lena glimpsed a ribbon of red hair. The sound of sobbing reached her. A girl. Female. Shiloh. But no, the red hair didn't fit. This wasn't Shiloh. Then who? Ahead of her, Bear went rigid, nose high in the air, ears pricked. He glanced back at Lena with an imploring expression. Go find her, Lena instructed. She drew her M&P-9, chambered around, and held it low at her side. But be careful. Bear dashed ahead. Shadows from the tree canopy overhead dappling his brown fur. Lena followed at a jog, leaping over fallen logs, sidestepping boulders, climbing the ravine with shore steps. At the top of the ridge, Bear let out a soft bark. Lena broke through a cluster of trees into a clearing. A figure faced away from her, a girl, half clothed in filthy shorts and a black tattered tank top, red hair dirty and tangled. The girl turned at the sound of Bear's bark, terror in her glassy blue eyes. She was trembling like a leaf. Lena didn't holster her weapon, but kept it low. Pity washed through her. This girl looked like she'd been through hell and back. I'm a friend. I won't hurt you. Lena looked around, tense and wary. Is there anyone else here? Are you in imminent danger? The girl opened her mouth, closed it, opened it again. She gave the tiniest shake of her head. Help. Yes, yes, I am here to help you. Lena holstered her gun, shrugged off her pack, and pulled out a water bottle, which she handed to the girl. She took out an emergency blanket and unwrapped it. What's your name, honey? Ruby. Carpenter. Ruby shivered as Lena wrapped the emergency blanket around her shoulders and placed the water bottle in her hands. Shakily, Ruby took a sip of water. I'm going to check you over, okay? Does it hurt anywhere? Lena knelt next to her and quickly assessed her vital signs, asking her questions to evaluate her physical and mental state. The girl was conscious, alert, breathing normally, with cuts and bruising. She checked her pupils, her pulse, 93 beats per minute. No evidence of head injury. Lena reached into her pack again and pulled out a tube of glucose gel to get her blood sugar levels up quickly. Ruby trembled, teeth chattering. It was clear she had experienced trauma, the kind that wouldn't always show on a cursory evaluation. This girl needed medical care, a hospital, a warm bed, people that loved her. But Shiloh was still out there. Lena hated to do it, but for the other girl's sake, she had to press Ruby, had to ask her the critical questions. What happened, honey? Did you come from the cabin? Something flickered behind her eyes, fear. Haltingly, she nodded. I, I ran. Urgency needled Lena. 
Did you see Shiloh Easton? Small, black hair, dark eyes. She, she got me out, but she stayed. She stayed back there to find her brother. The girl shook her head. It's a bad place, a terrible place. If he comes back, if he finds her. The girl shook her head, mute with terror. Fear slithered up Lena's spine. She wanted to run into that dilapidated cabin herself. She was a rescuer. Every fiber of her body longed to save Shiloh. Ruby, this is very important. The man who took you, is he alone? The girl stared at her blankly. Lena was losing her. She was retreating into her mind, into her terror. Gently, Lena gripped her shoulders and squeezed. Honey, you can help Shiloh, okay? This is how you help her. Is he the only one? The only one I've seen, the girl rasped. Yes. Lena reached for the radio. 64. Shiloh Easton. Day 8. When I am through with you, you'll wish you were in that hole, Boone said. Shiloh thought of Ruby, locked down in that fetid hole in the ground. How the girl had chewed through her own ropes to free herself. She thought of Cody, how he'd chosen to leap off a cliff to give her a chance to escape. And she thought of her mother, all the survivors who had come before her. Some had won, some had lost. All had fought to the bitter end. Their blood ran through her veins, through the veins of every girl who'd ever been hurt, every woman who'd been hit, every boy who'd been damaged. She knew their terror and their strength. Shiloh Easton would not let them down. This would not be her end. He was the worst kind of Wendigo, an evil spirit who consumed beauty, who saw innocence and wanted to crush it, who ravaged and defaced and destroyed every good thing. Like Cody, she would not let him have her. I'm going to kill you, she said, and spat on him. Traitorous tears leaked from the corners of her eyes. Boone leaned over her, and grasped her armpits. Shiloh writhed like a fish caught in a net, struggling to twist around and land a kick. Her ribs throbbed. She fought anyway. Surging upward, she sank her bared teeth into his right earlobe. The man screamed and wrenched back. She did not let go. Warm blood gushed between her lips, flesh tore. She bit down and tore out a chunk of cartilage. He howled, you filthy little. She spat the wad of flesh from her mouth and snarled. Gasping, chest heaving, hands still bound behind her, blood dribbled down her chin. On her back, she kicked out, desperate and furious. Her heel smashed his face, a crunch of cartilage and bone. Her heart, a frantic thing in her chest, terror locked in her throat. Boone gave a wet howl. Blood streamed from his nose. Maybe it was broken. She sure as hell hoped so. He rose over her, eyes like dead beetles. Blood ringed his mouth like a depraved clown. He gripped the iron hawk lamp base in both hands. He raised the base over his head. Shiloh screamed. 65. Eli Pope. Day 8. Eli crouched at the edge of the clearing, preparing himself for the assault. He pushed out the fear, his misgivings, and ticked through tactical options in his head, weaknesses, and stress points. Jackson had already moved to the other side of the cabin, ready to breach the back door. The existence of Ruby Carpenter changed everything. With Lena's help, they'd swiftly extracted critical information. The layout of the cabin, the furniture, the rooms, how the hostel likely had Shiloh restrained with ropes, the trap door 
with the pit dug underneath the floorboards. As he'd suspected, the cabin wasn't booby-trapped. Boone came and went using the front door. He had a handgun and a shotgun, plenty of ammo, and he was currently alone. They would make a dynamic entry and go in gangbusters. Creating an environment of chaos gave them the advantage of clarity and dominance. If they went in fast and explosive, clearing room by room, Eli hoped to take the hostel by surprise and eliminate him before he could kill Shiloh. The element of surprise was good. The element of sheer terror was better. With Ruby's help, the odds were no longer 50-50. They had a chance. A scream filtered through the trees. It came from inside the cabin. Adrenaline shot through Eli's veins. He sprinted toward the cabin, weapon drawn. We're going in hot. Go, go, go. 66. Eli Pope. Day 8. Eli lowered into a half crouch and crossed the 50-yard clearing, approaching the cabin from the east, windowless side. His AK-47 at his shoulder, he continually scanned for threats. His breathing steadied, a cold calm descending over him. It was go time. There was little concealment between the tree line and the cabin. He moved fast and low, weeds swishing against his shins. The ghillie suit blurred his outline, but he was far from hidden. The aurora rippled in crimson ribbons overhead, the night brighter than a full moon. Crickets whirred in the grass, an owl hooted. He reached the edge of the cabin, ducked behind a large rain barrel, and bladed his body against the wall, every sense on high alert, nerves raw. A male voice came from inside the cabin, vicious and threatening. Silently, he cut the corner, leading with his weapon, and made his way along the front of the building toward the door. At the first window, he rose, keeping his profile low, and peered inside. The black curtains blocked his sight line. Boom, boom! Several thunderous cracks sounded. Jackson had fired the 12-gauge TKO, breaching rounds at the hinges of the back door, blowing it open. Urgency crackled through him. Eli sprinted for the front door. With great force, he kicked the door in, his boot striking above the door handle. The cabin was old. The half-rotted frame crumbled inward. The door crashed open. He breached the entry point and rushed inside. The cabin's layout, sharp in his mind. He ducked to one knee, slicing the pie with the AK-47 pressed to his shoulder. He glimpsed a living room, a sofa, a coffee table, hostile at the 12 o'clock position, 10 feet away. Boone had dropped a large object he held in both hands and lunged for a pistol laying on the coffee table. He seized it and twisted toward Eli. Before Boone could squeeze the trigger, Eli fired three times in rapid succession. The rounds stitched across Boone's chest. The force of the impacts knocked him backward into the coffee table. His arms flailed, spent brass clattered to the plank floor. Eli fired again. The last round drilled into the center of his face. The 762 by 39 millimeter projectile tore through flesh and bone at 700 meters per second. As it exited, it ripped a crater in the back of the man's skull. Boone collapsed onto the coffee table. Glass shattered. The body flopped backward onto the floor, unmoving. Weapon still up, Eli eased around the sofa and looked down. The hostel was dead. Blood as black as oil pooled around his head. Between the sofa and the coffee table, Shiloh cowered. Her legs were drawn up to her chest, hands bound with rope behind her back. Scared out of her mind, but alive. He dropped to one knee, said her name, once, twice. Blood from her split lip smeared her chin. Bruises in the shape of fingers formed over the white column of her throat. Anger slashed through him. If Boone wasn't already dead, Eli would have killed him again. 
peeled off his fingernails, sliced off his balls, and stuffed them down his throat. Shiloh stared up at him dully, her eyes glazed and unseeing. Fear shimmered behind her eyes. Don't touch me! I'll cut you! Her voice dissolved into a ragged sob. Don't touch me! She looked so young, small, and vulnerable. How had this girl tracked down a child murderer and dared to face him? Reckless and stupid, but brave as hell. Would you like me to cut the rope, tying your wrists? Something in her eyes flickered to the surface. She managed to nod, then twisted sideways and showed him her bound hands. He leaned the AK-47 against the sofa, drew his knife from his belt and sawed through the ropes, releasing her. Shiloh flinched from his touch, then scrambled to her hands and knees and scurried away from him. She backed herself into a corner next to the bookshelf. Her knees pulled up, her arms wrapped around her legs. She rocked back and forth. The crossbow lay next to her. He moved toward her, slow and cautious, like she was a wild animal. Hey, hey, it's okay. He needed to make sure she was all right. Needed to ensure she wasn't going to stab or shoot anyone from shock. She was terrified. Everyone and everything was a threat. As he spoke, he checked her over visually, making sure she hadn't been hit by a round or ricochet or flying debris. Shallow cuts and bruises marred her arms and face, her lip bloody. He didn't detect broken bones or contusions. Luckily. They hadn't needed to use the flashbangs. You're okay, Shiloh. It's me, Eli. You know me. I'm not going to hurt you. The girl didn't even look at him, just kept rocking back and forth. She needed Lena, not him. She needed warmth and softness and comfort. All the things he didn't know how to give her. Rocking back on his heels, he picked up the rifle. He couldn't relax, couldn't drop his guard for a second. He half turned and froze. Jackson stood in the doorway of the cabin's single bedroom, watching him. The body lay sprawled on the wooden floor between them. Jackson shouldered his shotgun. He pointed the barrel at Eli. 67. Jackson Cross, Day 8 Jackson's gaze shifted from Eli to the body on the floor to Shiloh. His heart contracted. He hadn't seen her in days. She was filthy, half wild, eyes crazed with panic and fear. Alarm filled him. Is she okay? I think she will be. She was alive gloriously alive, and Walter Boone was dead. Jackson felt dizzy, disoriented. He hated that the perp was dead and would never stand trial for his crimes, would never see justice done. And yet, a small part of him felt a flare of abject relief. Jackson aimed the shotgun at Eli. Put that gun down. On one knee, crouched a few feet from Shiloh, Eli watched him, utterly still. You know it was a good shot. Put it down. Eli lowered the AK-47 to the floor. Your pistol too, kick it away. Eli obeyed. The pistol skittered several feet across the floor. It was a good shot. Shiloh is alive. You're still alive. So am I. Eli was right. It was over. And yet, it wasn't. He stood facing a killer. A killer he'd been forced to rely on to eliminate a worse killer. The deed was done. He didn't need Eli anymore. Eli didn't need him. As long as Eli was out and free, he presented a clear and present danger to the community, to Jackson himself. Eli gazed at him steadily, as if daring him to go through with it. If it matters so much, do it, Eli said. 
When you look in the mirror, what will you see? A cop or a killer? You think you can live with that? Jackson couldn't live with that, and they both knew it. He couldn't shoot an unarmed man, not even Eli Pope. This was not who he was, not who he wanted to be. Besides, they still had Shiloh to worry about. Resigned, he willed himself to lower the shotgun. This isn't over. I wouldn't expect it to be, Eli said. I'm getting my weapons. Reluctantly, Jackson nodded. Eli retrieved his guns, holstered his H&K VP9, and shouldered the rifle with careful movements, never taking his eyes off Jackson. In the corner, Shiloh let out a whimper. Compassion and concern welled inside him. They were here for Shiloh. She deserved every ounce of their attention. How can I help? She won't respond to me, Eli said. Get Lena. She doesn't know Lena, Jackson said, doubtful. Lena can help. She'll know what to do. Eli unhooked his radio and brought it to his mouth. Lena, come in. The radio crackled. Lena's voice broke through, filled with static, barely audible. I heard gunshots. Is he dead? Shiloh? Safe? Shiloh is here. She needs you. A minute later, Lena entered the cabin. She paused in the shattered doorway, taking in the scene. Is everyone okay? Eli? Jackson? Eli watched Shiloh. I'm fine. Jackson's legs felt rubbery. The adrenaline dump hit him hard, his whole body going weak and shaky. He needed to lie down, to sleep for a week. I I'm good. It's Shiloh we need to worry about. Lena turned toward the girl. Shiloh? Without a word, Shiloh bolted to her feet. She seized the crossbow and streaked between them in a blur, nearly knocking Lena over in the doorway. She disappeared into the night. Eli stared after her, dumbfounded. What is she doing? Jackson asked. What I would do in her shoes? Lena said in a stricken voice. She's going to run. 68. Eli Pope. Day 8. Shiloh, let us help you, Eli said. Don't run. Shiloh hovered at the edge of the clearing, skittish as a deer. She held the crossbow pointed at the ground. It was loaded. I don't have anybody. The aurora undulated overhead, weaker, but still bright. Transparent waves of crimson, tangerine, and shades of coral and wine cast the clearing in a reddish glow, the edge of things glimmering like burnished copper. You do. You do have someone. Lena stepped forward. She looked astonished at the sight of her niece, enraptured, smitten. Hope shone from her eyes, but so did fear. Shiloh looked from Jackson to Eli to Lena, confused, bewildered, edgy and scared. In a minute, maybe less, they'd lose her. This is your mother's sister, Eli said. Your Aunt Lena. Hey, Lena said softly. Shiloh retreated a step toward the woods, toward the safety of trees and space and sky, independence and freedom, cold nights and an empty belly, toward loneliness. Eli knew that loneliness as intimately as his own scarred soul. He recognized that terror in her eyes because it was his own. You can trust her. Eli said. Shiloh shook her head. Her eyes glittered. I don't have an aunt. My grandfather said she was dead to us. She didn't want anything to do with us, and so we shouldn't have anything to do with her. She left when my mom was killed because she was too selfish to take care of her own flesh and blood. Lena flinched like she'd been punched in the stomach. Eli could see it etched on her face. Pain, guilt, regret. She opened her mouth closed it. Her shoulders hunched like she was warding off a blow. 
I don't want anything to do with family like that. I can take care of myself. Eli knows that. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. Jackson took a step toward her. Shiloh. Shiloh leapt back like he'd tried to bite her. Stay away from me. I'm warning you. Her voice was high and raw, her arms shaking. Her eyes darted from one person to the next, unable to settle. Eli knew that they needed to be very, very careful. She was a grenade, about to go off. She wasn't herself, teetering on the brink of a psychological break. She could easily slip into a fugue state. This was a girl who'd endured severe emotional trauma. She'd witnessed her grandfather's murder. Then she'd been trapped in a cabin with a psychopath, a man who'd tied her up, beaten her, and had nearly buried her in that pit beneath his cabin. Eli took small, gradual steps toward her without drawing her attention. He was close enough to tackle her if that crossbow rose, if she pointed it at Lena. He couldn't risk Lena's life. He wouldn't. If they dared take her by force, she would hate them forever. He knew that about her like he knew it about himself. Force was a last resort. He would do it if he had to. You're right, Lena said softly. Shiloh's head jerked up, dark eyes narrowed in suspicion. You're right, Lena said louder this time. I should have been here. I never should have left you. I left this town. I left my father, your grandfather. That's what I left. That's what I was running from, my own fear and my own shame. Lena's gaze shifted to Eli before returning to Shiloh. Not you, Shiloh. Not you and not Cody. I loved you. I love you. I know you can't believe that right now, and that's okay. I understand. I hope someday that you will believe that it's true. Shiloh listened, trembling but rapt. I know what it's like to feel like you're running from something bigger and scarier than you are. I know what it's like to feel alone and like you can't trust anyone. If I had been here, Lena's voice caught. This wouldn't have happened to you, precious girl. None of this would have happened. Lena, Jackson started. Lena waved him off. She held her hands out to Shiloh, palms spread, placating, begging. Guilt and hope warred across her face. I'm not leaving this time. I'm not going anywhere. Eli felt their pain. He felt the years of bitterness, resentment, and betrayal. This moment was theirs. He couldn't step in. Jackson couldn't step in. Lena would win Shiloh in this moment, or not at all. Shiloh's crossbow wavered. Eli tensed, ready to intervene. I'm going to walk toward you. Tell me to stop if you want me to, and I will. I won't do anything you don't want me to, okay? We're a team. That's how I work. Lena didn't point, didn't gesture. Her hands didn't move at all. Her voice was calm and steady. Do you see that dog over there? That's Bear. Shiloh's gaze flicked to Bear, who'd sat up at the sound of his name ears pricked and tail wagging. He'd been sitting with Ruby, who huddled against a tree trunk across the clearing, wrapped in an emergency blanket. Shiloh nodded. Together, we find people who are missing. We bring them back home. We save them. I can't do it without Bear, and he can't do it without me. We need each other. Lena took another step. I think that you and I could be the same way. We can be a team. We can help each other. Watch out for each other. Bear rose to his feet and trotted to Lena's side. He pressed his furry torso against Lena's thigh and looked at Shiloh with interest. Lena took another step. Five feet between them now. Eli didn't take his eyes off them, off that crossbow. Bear would like to meet you. Would you like to meet him? I don't know. It's okay. Take your time. No one is going to force anything on you, okay? It's your choice. Shiloh stared at the dog. 
Lena took another step, and another. Bear moved with her, right at her side, a foot between them. Shiloh stared up at her, scared, and angry, and uncertain. Her hands trembled on the crossbow. Shiloh, Lena said, could you please put the crossbow down? You don't need it right now. The girl's lower lip quivered. Her skin was bone pale. She was going to collapse or try to kill someone. Eli would be ready either way. You're safe, Shiloh. Lena did not reach for the crossbow. She kept her hands open, palms out, showing Shiloh her vulnerability, that Shiloh had the choice every step of the way. It worked. Shiloh set the crossbow on the ground, still loaded, but facing away from Lena and the others. Eli stepped in quickly and took it. Cody, Shiloh whispered. Cody is dead, Lena said. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Out of the corner of his eye, Eli saw Jackson go rigid, a stricken expression on his face. They had all held out hope, even against the odds. Lena motioned with her hand, signaling to Bear, who bounded to Shiloh. The dog could have bowled the girl over, but he stopped short, sniffing her hair, tail wagging. Startled, Shiloh froze. Bear licked her face. She melted, her arms slipping around the dog, the dog pressing against her. Lena sank to her knees beside the girl and the dog. Gently, she placed one hand on Bear's back, one hand on Shiloh's. She spoke low, soothing words Eli couldn't discern, but he didn't need to. He'd seen it in Shiloh's eyes. Lena had captured Shiloh's heart as fully as she'd captured his own. They had a lot to figure out, a long road to healing, but they would be okay. Over their heads, Eli and Jackson locked eyes. Mortal enemies they might be, but they shared this connection, whether they liked it or not. For Shiloh, he held in his animosity. And for Lena. The memories rushed back in. The familiar feelings, that pull. Not even prison could kill that part of him, much as he'd tried. Tried to forget how she smiled. The tiny dimple in the center of her chin. Her husky laugh. He'd lost her when he'd cheated. But he'd never stopped loving her. Her heart was stronger, fiercer, more compassionate than anyone he'd ever met. He remembered how she used to look at him. Like he could be the good man reflected in her eyes. That was an eternity ago. A century. Another man had lived that life. Another man had been given that chance at a different future. And he'd squandered it. Second chances didn't exist for him. Not in this harsh world. And yet, his heart constricted when he looked at her. He watched them, kneeling, clutching each other, a moment of grace that stole his breath away. The wind picked up. A cool breeze rushed through the hushed clearing, rustling the leaves. The shadows wavered and stretched across the ground. Bear wriggled from Shiloh's arms. He trotted several yards away, then turned in a tight circle. Hackles raised, nose high in the air. He whined, deep in his throat, low and mournful. Lena raised her head, alert to her dog's body language. She smoothed Shiloh's ragged hair from her face and rocked back on her heels, her attention on Bear. What is it, boy? The dog trotted to the edge of the clearing before glancing back at Lena, ears pricked but tail down, tucked between his legs. Lena rose to her feet. Shiloh stood with her. What is it? Jackson asked. Bear just alerted. What does that mean? Eli asked. Lena kept her arm around Shiloh's shoulders as she turned to face Jackson, her expression grim, sorrow evident in her blue eyes. That's his sign for cadavers. Eli's body went taut. Adrenaline coursed through his veins. His hand moved to his VP-9. You mean Boone's corpse? 
Lena met his gaze and shook her head. Not him. There's another dead body here. 69. Jackson Cross. Day 8. Behind the cabin, they found the graves. Bear had looked like a dog who'd been whipped, whimpering, head down, tail tucked. The Newfoundland slunk among the trees, stopping and alerting three times, then four, then five. Jackson placed a small flag at each spot. His guts turned to water with each new marker. Seven grave sites, seven dead bodies. Crime scene tape fluttered in the sweeping flashlight beams. Gas-operated spotlights had been set up around the perimeter. The hushed voices of law enforcement officers murmured as they moved around the mounds of dirt and body bags, snapping photos and collecting evidence. A low hum of dread vibrated through the clearing. Jackson hadn't wanted to leave the crime scene, but he'd used the Jeep Wrangler that Boone had hidden less than a quarter mile away. They'd found the missing Ford F-150 with it. On a wider sweep of the property, Eli had discovered both vehicles camouflaged beneath pine boughs along an overgrown, abandoned forest road. Jackson drove the rutted forest road that came out onto a paved road several miles west back into town. Lena, Shiloh, and Ruby rode with him. With satellites and ground stations damaged, even satellite phones were inoperable. And with the repeater network offline, their two-way radios were reduced to a shortened range of only a few miles. Once he was within radio range, he'd flagged down Devon. Devon had taken Lena and the girls to the hospital. She promised to contact Michelle Carpenter as well. Ruby was traumatized, but she was alive. Both girls were alive. By any measure, it was a win. Devon had located the sheriff and several deputies, plus the munising police chief and three police officers. Jackson and the other law enforcement officers had traveled back to the cabin in trucks and ATVs. The indigo sky lightened to shades of gray. Dawn hid behind the trees. Eli had been sequestered on scene by two deputies. Though he'd been deputized, he'd shot and killed a suspect. It was a homicide. It would be up to the DA to determine if it was a justifiable homicide. Such investigations could last a long time, up to a year. He wasn't sure what would happen. In the morning, reporters would descend upon them in a frenzy. The state police would come up from Detroit, probably the FBI. They needed forensic anthropologists and pathologists. The case would be taken from them. They'd be treated like country bumpkin cops who spent more time eating donuts than solving cases. Or maybe not. That was the way things used to be. The world was changing so rapidly it made him dizzy. Behind the cabin, the medical examiner crouched over a mound of freshly upturned dirt. A black body bag lay unzipped on the ground beside her. Moreno and Hastings stood nearby, watching. She looked up as Jackson approached. The six remains that we've uncovered so far have been here for several months to several years. Their clothes are disintegrated from the acidic body fluids but for the nylon in seams and waistbands. Due to the shorter sacrum and wider pelvic bones, I can tell you that the skeletal remains are female. Since bones continue to grow and fuse until the age of 25, I can also estimate that the victims are between their late teens and early 20s. I'll be able to compare the bone growth charts and narrow it down in the morgue. Jackson wanted to curse, to scream at the sky. How could they have missed this? These poor, lost girls, buried beneath the earth for so long. They had called out, and no one had heard them. No one had saved them. Moreno covered his mouth and nose with one gloved hand. The stench of human decomposition was distinct, like nothing else Jackson had ever smelled. What about this one? 
the Emmy bent closer to the gravesite and pointed. This corpse is fresh, comparatively speaking. Judging by the maggots and insects' stages of development and the level of soft tissue breakdown, it's in advanced decay. I roughly estimate a month. Moreno and Jackson exchanged tense glances. This got worse and worse. Dr. Vertanen pointed to an object in the dirt that she had brushed away from the corpse. You should see this. Hastings squatted and picked it up with a pair of tweezers, his hands gloved. The dirt-clotted object glinted beneath the spotlight. Jackson could make out the gold chain, the half-heart locket. A locket, just like the one that had been found on Lily Easton's body. A hole opened in Jackson's chest. It was hard to breathe. The whir of insects filled his ears. The cool morning air kissed the back of his neck like the breath of a ghost. His words felt like glass in his throat. Check the victim's hair. Dr. Vertanen showed them a section of hacked-off black hair. Is this what you were looking for? And the locket? What's inside? With great care, Hasting opened the locket and revealed a matching swatch of hair curled inside. The exact appearance of the locket had never been released. Neither had the detail of the victim's hair inside the locket. The signature of the broken heart killer, Moreno said, shocked. Were these victims strangled? Hasting asked. Preliminary findings? Yes. You can see the hyoid bone is broken here. Were they beaten as well? Too early to tell. I need to conduct the autopsies. For at least several of these homicides, Eli Pope had been locked away in prison. It didn't make sense. A copycat? Moreno asked. Jackson shook his head. A copycat wouldn't know such intimate details. What about the other victims? The Emmy nodded. We haven't found the locket on every corpse, but we've just started. But yes, three so far. Hastings slipped the locket into an evidence envelope. He stood and brushed off his pants. You think Boone did this? That he was the broken heart killer all along? Jackson didn't answer, neither did Moreno. Jackson fisted his hands on his hips and half turned, gazing at the bleak clearing, the sad mounded graves, the flags a snap of color in the gray light. A tsunami of doubt washed over Jackson. All these years he'd been so certain. That certainty had defined him, had driven him, justified him. In doing one thing wrong, he'd righted the world. That foundation moved beneath his feet, no longer solid, but cracked and crumbling, things shifting, altering, pieces falling into place. Though he was standing upright, he had the disorienting sensation of falling. He'd been wrong. So terribly wrong. Seventy. Jackson Cross. Day Eight. Hours later, Jackson and Devin visited the Munising Hospital. He hadn't slept. He was weary to the bone, his eyes gritty. Adrenaline and sheer willpower drove him on, kept him upright. The hospital's generator was still running, but medical supplies were running critically low. Wait times in the ER were over 24 hours. The doctors and nurses looked as exhausted as he did. Shiloh sat up in the hospital bed. A crisp white sheet spread across her legs, machines monitoring her vitals beeping softly. An IV was hooked to her arm. The air smelled sterile. Eli was present. He paced like a caged panther in the narrow confines of the hospital room. Though the shooting investigation was ongoing, Eli had been released on his own recognizance. Lena sat next to the bed in a plastic chair, holding Shiloh's hand. Bear lay on the floor at her feet. His tail thumped as Jackson and Devin entered. Hey, you, 
Lena said tiredly. Eli said nothing at all. Jackson could barely look at him. He could feel Eli's dark eyes burning holes in his soul. He knew he would have to face Eli, that a reckoning was coming. But that time was not now. Jackson managed a smile for Shiloh and pulled a plastic chair next to Lena. Devin stood behind him with her notebook and pen. Can we talk about what happened? It's better when it's fresh, but only if you're okay with it. Dressed in a hospital gown, Shiloh leaned forward, eyes alert and burning like two black coals. Her cuts had been bandaged. She was clean, her black hair washed and glossy. Still, she looked like a girl who'd fought her way through the underworld, dragged into hell like Persephone. But she hadn't demurely accepted her fate. She'd clawed and bit and scratched her way to freedom. Ask, she said. Ask the questions you need to ask. Seeming to sense Shiloh's stress, Bear rose, sniffed the girl's hand, then leapt on the hospital bed. The frame shuddered beneath his weight. Chuffing in pleasure, Bear flopped onto Shiloh's thighs like a giant overstuffed teddy bear. Shiloh hesitated for a moment, then buried her hands into the rough of the big dog's fur, letting him give her strength and comfort. Lena leaned forward and rubbed Shiloh's back. We can do this later. You don't have to. Shiloh looked at Eli. Eli stilled. They exchanged a wordless glance, heavy with things Jackson didn't understand and wasn't privy to. After a moment, Eli nodded at her. Her narrow shoulders straightened. She lifted her chin. Her cheekbones were sharp as knife blades, her eyes dark wells. I'm ready. Her words came stilted and jerky, but they came. What had happened that day at the salvage yard? How Cody had told her to hide? How he'd sacrificed himself to save her? And how Easton had fought for his grandchildren in the end? In his last moments on this bleak earth, he'd chosen to be a hero. Jackson heard it in Shiloh's voice. She knew it. A small gift. A spark of hope in the darkness. Can you tell us about last night, Devin asked. Start from the beginning. Take your time. What happened? In a halting voice, Shiloh told them how she'd seen the man in the black boots in town. How she'd figured out how to find the cabin. How she'd discovered Ruby Carpenter, freed her, and then found herself trapped with a predator. Her gaze flicked to her backpack at Lena's feet. I have a picture that you need. It's in there. I found it in Calvin Fitch's trailer under his bed. It wasn't his. We know, Jackson said gently. We found the box. Look, she insisted. Even though the chain of custody had been broken, Jackson donned a pair of latex gloves, opened her backpack, and retrieved the manila envelope with the note she'd written, the words cut from magazines. He withdrew the photo. The face of an Ojibwe teenage girl stared at him, both hostile and vulnerable. A face he recognized. Heart in his throat. He slid the photo back into the envelope and handed it to Devin. They hadn't yet identified the remains of the corpses, including the freshest one. He feared they had just found her. This is Summer Tabasaw. She's from Marquette. Jackson turned back to Shiloh. Boone is dead now. He's never going to hurt you or anyone else again. It's over, honey. It's over. Shiloh's hand shot out and seized his. Her skin was cold as ice, but her fingers were strong, firm. Her eyes burned with dark fire. There's another one. Walter Boone was not alone. 71. Jackson Cross. Day 9. Jackson stared at the crime scene photos tacked to the bulletin board against the wall. The power was off in the building. No generator hummed. Battery-operated lanterns provided light. Sheriff Underwood came to stand beside him. 
he clasped his hands behind his back. Hell of a thing. That girl is lucky as hell you and Pope found her. His granite face hardened. What the hell were you doing with him at that cabin? It's a long story. I've written up the report. It's a cluster of epic proportions. You realize that, right? You deputize a convicted felon who then shoots our perp. What the living hell happened? The investigation will clear him. He's a better shot than I am, and he was special forces. It was the right play. We only had one chance to save the hostage. Sheriff Underwood shook his head. I don't even know where to start. It's not even the most bizarre part of the case. We're riding the crazy train, and no one will let us off. Eli Pope is innocent. The words were glass in his throat. He didn't kill Lily Easton. Guilt ate at Jackson, a darkness he could not yet face, but he knew he would have to. The reckoning that Eli Pope had promised him was coming, and he would deserve it. Sheriff Underwood ran a hand over his bald head and frowned. Even if Pope is innocent, the town won't like it. They won't accept it. They've hated him for too long. Maybe, Jackson said. They'll have to. They won't have a choice. Another problem for tomorrow. We ready to close this case? Shiloh said Walter Boone had an accomplice, Jackson said. Did she see someone else? Does she have a name, an ID? No. He could have been lying to her. It wouldn't be the first time a perp minimized his crimes to his victims. Or she was mistaken, in her fear and panic. It's possible, Jackson allowed. Stop chasing ghosts, son. We got him. The sheriff's gaze went distant. Jackson didn't like the look in his eyes. There was fear there, and weakness. Sheriff Underwood wanted to believe that Boone had killed Lily, that he was the same monster who'd killed and buried seven girls in the deep woods of the Hiawatha National Forest. He wanted to believe because it was the easy choice, and Sheriff Underwood always took the easy way. Jackson was not convinced. He had no evidence to go on other than Shiloh's testimony. And it was true. Boone could have lied to her. But he didn't think so. Lily's ghost had never let him go because he hadn't caught the right killer. It had not been Eli, and it wasn't Boone. Jackson felt that truth deep in his bones, though he couldn't prove it. Not yet. Boone had chased Cody over the cliff. He'd dumped a body somewhere in Lake Superior. He'd kidnapped Ruby Carpenter and locked her in an abandoned, derelict cabin, as he'd done to a numberless group of vulnerable girls before her. For years, maybe for decades. And then, when he'd tired of them, he had offered them to someone else. An unsub who remained at large, hunting the shores of Lake Superior, who prowled the rural towns of the Upper Peninsula, whose playground was the isolated wilderness that Jackson called home. Were there more girls? More secret grave sites? Were they all dead, or were some of them trafficked somewhere else in the UP? There was so much more that he needed to uncover. Jackson said, If there's a second unsub, I'm going to find him. The sheriff rubbed his eyes and turned away from the crime scene photos. Get some shut-eye, son. I haven't slept in a week, you know that? Jackson didn't doubt it. Deep shadows ringed his eyes. His brown skin was ashen. Deep brackets lined his mouth. None of us have, sir. The sheriff stared at nothing, impotent and overwhelmed. I need a team. Jackson said. We bring in the FBI. They'll trample all over this case, but they have resources we don't, especially now. The feds have their hands full. Hell, so do we. We'll get it done. We have to. 
You know there's rioting in Marquette and the Sioux? I heard. It's spreading. The grocery stores in every city in the entire state are empty. Empty. You expect this in Detroit, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, but here? The governor declared a state of emergency. The National Guard has been called in. The Coast Guard and Army Corps of Engineers are trying to maintain order at the locks. We're hearing reports of whole hordes of people trying to cross the Big Mac, he said, referring to the Mackinac Bridge. In cars, on bikes, a few ran out of gas, and they're pushing damn shopping carts. Can you imagine? They think they'll be safer up here. Ten days into this thing, Cross. It's like everyone lost their minds when those transformers blew. What the hell is happening? Jackson recalled Lena's words, the chill that had crawled up his spine at his first glimpse of the aurora, the millions of lights blinking out, one by one. The beginning of the end. That's the same thing all those conspiracy videos on YouTube said. You scare the hell out of me when you talk like that. I only say what I see right in front of me. Sheriff Underwood rubbed his grizzled face. Well, stop it. I need a team, Jackson said, quieter, firmer. You never listen, you know that? There's a killer out there, and I'm going to find him. We have to protect this town. That's what I'm doing. For a long moment, Sheriff Underwood didn't speak. I don't have the manpower, Jackson. You understand? I need you. If you're right. He shook his head again. Damn it. I need every hand I have available. We need supplies. We need to maintain order, put up roadblocks, figure out how we make this work going forward, and make damn sure the masses downstate don't reach us and wreck what we have. I know. He'd said this before and had been ignored. At least the sheriff was listening now. It wasn't too late. He hoped it wasn't. I know. The sheriff heard him, but he couldn't help. He was drowning, and he knew it. The man headed for the door, leaving Jackson alone with the case, with his ghosts. Sheriff Underwood hesitated in the doorway. Don't let this case eat you up, Jackson. Jackson didn't speak. He couldn't. His mind whirred, sifting through facts and clues and possibilities. He could feel the killer out there, slinking through the shadows just out of his reach. One who would see the coming chaos as an opportunity. Shiloh's words echoed in his mind. There's another one. And as the world lost its light, Jackson didn't know if he had what it took to bring him down. 72. Jackson Cross. Day 10. The aurora was gone. Not that it mattered. The sun had already done its damage. In the blink of an eye, Half of the planet had been thrust 150 years into the past. Hundreds of millions of people in shock, with no idea how bad things would get, or how quickly. The world was reeling. The aftershocks were just beginning. Jackson moved through the darkened house, past the candles on the mantel, with the photos of his missing brother, like a shrine. Past the shadowed dining room with the empty chairs, and the dust gathering on the buffet to the French doors leading to the expansive deck. He could feel his father's eyes on him, his sister, and his mother, all watching him, studying him, analyzing him, finding him wanting. He fumbled at the latch, swung the doors open, and stepped onto the deck. The setting sun dipped low on the horizon. Vibrant yellows, oranges, and crimsons streaked the clouds. Lake Superior reflected the jagged shoreline, the limestone cliffs, the lush trees. Sunlight, like burnished gold, painted the waves. It was a sight he'd seen a thousand times, familiar, yet no longer comforting. Instead of the tranquil beauty of the Great Lake, he felt the coldness in his bones, the great sunken ships 
rested in the dark, symbols of man's hubris, their weakness against nature's wrath. The placid surface hid the bodies of the dead. Cody Easton was among them. They might never find his corpse. But he was out there. He was a part of it now. The icy lake, the harsh wild, the ghosts of the deep. A great grief rolled through him. The crumbling of things he didn't yet fully understand, as the foundation of the everything he knew gave way. The world was disintegrating. It was slower here, but it was happening. He could feel it, could see people fraying at the edges. Things were bad, and about to get much worse. He had relied upon the laws and the rules to protect him, to protect them all. And what now? How would those laws change? Who would enforce them? Protect the people? As the sun sank, a seed of resolve grew within him. He could not fix the breaking world, but whatever was in his power to fix, he would do it. For Lena, his best friend, returned home at last. For Shiloh, the fierce orphan he adored. For Lily and Cody, those who he had failed. And for Eli, the boy he'd loved like a brother and then betrayed. For all of them. For the innocent children they once were and the broken men and women they had become. There had to be redemption. It existed. He believed. We hope you have enjoyed The Light We Lost, a post-apocalyptic survival thriller. Lost Light Book One Written by Kyla Stone Read for you by Stacy Glomboski The audio for this book was engineered by Aaron Meadows The Light We Lost is copyright 2022 by Kyla Stone Production copyright 2022 All rights reserved Thank you for listening <laughs>